microsite. It is intense. Have you been here? Yeah, we just we, uh, yeah. We just yeah. left Friday. Oh, we were there Friday. Yeah. Good stuff over here. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. This hearing is called to order. This is a public hearing of, of the City Council Committee on Economic and Commerce and Economic Development. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on resolution number 160386. Will the clerk please read the title of the resolution? Resolution number 160386, a resolution authorizing the Commerce and Economic Development Committee to hold public hearings on vertical farming, hydroponic farming, and aqu aquaponic systems in Philadelphia. I just want to say, first of all, that uh, uh, in the 4th District, we are pleased and proud to have 66% of the parkland in Philadelphia. So uh, inadvertently, I became the not no pun intended the green council person i am officially on the record turning over the title uh, to councilman tallenberg uh, with this resolution on some innovative ways that we can repurpose uh land create jobs and create a healthy harvest and with that uh chair recognizes councilman tallenberg chairman jones thank you uh, very much and thank you all for being here witnesses we look forward to hearing what you have to say but certainly would like to say a couple things uh, personally in 1975 I graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy for those that may not know what that is I think this group does at soil science and field crop manager I had a number of jobs awaiting me which is kind of uh, very interesting in a day of highly competitive jobs uh, I was a ground supervisor at Friends Hospital for over three and a half years. During my tenure there, um, we won several awards. It shows you how important this is to me personally. Um, we also had many, many classes with, uh, I was on the landscape end of things, not on the food production end of things. But one of my professors, Professor Bergman from Penn State University Plant Nutrition said very clearly to us, when you put food on someone's table, you're really doing the Lord's work. You're giving them something really, really special. That's what agricultural people do. And for me to be able to use the knowledge I have at this very point in time is something very special to me. Philadelphia is America's largest, poorest city. There are food deserts. There are problems here. People need jobs. People need nutrition. Well, I think we're on the cutting edge of something very special indeed, and a number of the folks that are out there have spoken to me earlier. I am very, very excited of the potential, Mr. Chairman. I think this will come forth in the hearing. And the best thing I think that the city of Philadelphia can do is help this grow, in many ways grow to make it easier for them through, you know, the, they don't have the overburden of zoning regulations and so on. Sure, we should examine them. We're not going to not do that. But on the other hand, we're on to something very, 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 very special. And Pennsylvania actually does have a very long history of agriculture. We are the fifth largest state in the Union for dairy production. We also produce many, many acres of corn and other things. So is we, we're, we're right in place to take the lead on this very serious urban agricultural initiative. And I'm delighted to be here and having this brought forward. And think about this. There are many hearings in this room. There's very few where you can actually get something to eat now. So that's uh, we do want to thank uh, the folks from Metropolis Farms for bringing all this. Mr. Chairman, as we had spoken earlier, and with your permission, I think there is a short video that if we can show that at this time, it will show the members of the council and the committees uh, what this is about and also some folks in the audience and what is some of the things that are going on. Very good, uh, Councilman, but I also want to recognize those who are here, Councilwoman Parker, Councilman Dom, Councilman Green, uh, and myself are also part of this committee. Are there any uh, comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, we can watch. <laughs> Oh, 
vertical farming as a concept has been around since the gardens of Babylon. Nothing new on this planet. What's happened is the technology has caught up to a point where it's efficient, vertical farming. Um, vertical farming can be done outdoors, which Babylon was doing it outdoors. Well, indoor vertical farming is taking everything that you need in a controlled environment and growing inside a building. Different people have tried different things. People have tried new buildings. I believe we have so many old buildings in areas like Philadelphia and New York and Boston and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Why wouldn't we grow inside an old building and revitalize it that way? In an outdoor farm, just as an example, in this area, in our area, if you're lucky, you'll get two and a half crops a year. I get 17.38 crops. So when it's snowing out, I'm still growing strawberries. Here we are in one of our controlled grow bays at Metropolis Farms. This particular rack over here grows the equivalent of an outdoor acre uh, in just 36 square feet. And if you look around, what you're seeing is you're seeing plants grown in a hydroponic system that accelerates their growth. We're growing right now 500 heads of lettuce in 32 feet. You multiply that by the amount of levels and it becomes pretty obvious that it's very easy to get to a million pounds of produce a year in a very small space. This particular space is on the second floor of the building. This is the first vertical farm ever to be built on anything other than a first floor. We did this for a very specific reason. We were trying to make the technology as adaptive as possible. We're actually on top of Philly Case, a 75-year-old case company. Our goal here is to be able to go into old buildings and find new ways of using them by growing food in them. I saw this project initially. I was the president of the Merchant Bank on Wall Street, and a very prominent Philadelphia family asked us to review the project. They wanted to put $25 million into it. At the time, the technology was very raw. It wasn't environmentally sound, economically sound, and there were a lot of claims being made that couldn't be backed up. Um, so we consequently turned the project down. It didn't work, but it bothered me because I saw that it could work and it needed someone to guide it to its next level. Um, it, it first was a hobby with me, then it became an obsession, and then uh, a couple of years ago I quit my job, began working with my partner Lee Weingrad, and we essentially closed our doors for two years, made a giant list of everything that was wrong with indoor vertical farming, and methodically went through it and crossed them off the list and said, this is going to work now, this is going to work now, and we resolved every issue related to it. My educational background is economics and physics. It had to be economically sustainable. It has to make money, otherwise it's just a hobby. Okay? It had to be nutritionally sustainable. The food has to be better food than you could otherwise get. Not as good, but better. And we were able to do that. And then, of course, it has to be environmentally sustainable. You can't use more energy than you would be using in an outdoor farm. It actually costs us less money to build an indoor acre than it would cost you to start an acre outdoors. The growth process starts here with a little substance called rock wool. Rock wool is spun volcanic rock. It has amazing ability to hold on to air and water at the same time. We just begin by placing the seeds in, in each hole, giving them a spray down of some uh, nutrient solution, and we cut them into shape. Depending on the actual strain, they'll either go to a hot uh, nursery or a cold. We have two different rooms for that. So depending on which what we're growing, uh, the germination rates are different. After germination, they get transported into our boards. Here we have chives. This was planted about six days ago. We placed them in these boards which actually float on our nutrient film. There's also a supply chain when it comes to the actual plants. We put the youngest ones up top, and then as they grow, it uh, could be a week or two week period, we bring them down, and that way they're really easy to harvest at the bottom. So you don't need a ladder to harvest our produce. It's much safer and easier. This is a few weeks later. This is the actual nutrient solution that the plants are floating on. It is a mixture of chelated minerals that are available directly to the plant. The roots aren't really large, they're very white and healthy, which means they're getting them out of the oxygen they need. The plant actually doesn't have to expend the same energy going down as it would normally have to to get, get to more nutrients and water. Since it's uh, available right to the roots at a, at a very short distance, the plants expend all their energy going upwards, which is what accelerates the growth rate and makes these plants so healthy. So, you know, at the end of the day, you get a faster growth rate, healthier roots, and an overall, you know, better tasting product. 
we're going to look at some of the technological advances. Um, and one thing that becomes obvious is the lights behind me are really, really strong. We developed our own light because we were uncomfortable with the lights that existed. Um, you know, a lot of folks are saying that LEDs are a new technology. Well, they were developed in 1927. Our lights use less electricity than an LED array and produce about twice the amount of light. We put them on robotics so that the robotics spread the light more evenly. The important thing is they cost a lot less. They make it much more available for farmers. 40 to 60 percent of the cost of starting a farm is the lighting. So we attack this from the perspective of, well, how can we create a democratizable technology if people can't afford the lighting? And we came up with solutions and, of course, also financial solutions so that we can finance the lights for people in the future um, and make it much more cost effective. This particular system measures the temperature, it measures our water levels, the nutrient levels, and the pH levels within the system and sends an email to the person who's on duty to their smartphone. Again, the concept of a smart farm, you know, um, that says, hey, tank number one, tank number two needs your attention. And they can work specifically on the things that matter. If you want to grow more food, you have to grow smarter. And that's the whole point of a smart farm or what we call a flash farm. When it comes to pesticides and herbicides, a lot of people ask me what the difference between vegan and organic is. The organic farmers are allowed to use up to 152 different uh, chemicals for pesticides or herbicides. Um, to be certified vegan, you're not allowed to use any. So we had to develop our own way of controlling bugs. Before we started the farm here, I, I was into this plant, many other carnivorous plants as a hobby, uh, just because I was uh, intrigued by the, how they you know, attract and eat bugs and digest animals. So we had to figure out a certain plant that could be used all year round. I found one particular strain of pinguicula that actually eats bugs all year round, and then I crossbred that with, the, with a bunch of different other strains to create our own plant. We call it the Terminator. We actually have it between each row of, of plants, uh, maybe up to two or three of them. We incorporate other carnivorous plants too, like Venus flytraps, pitcher plants, droceras, and we use them whenever we can for larger bugs. So this right here is an example of a pinguicula. This is the actual plant. And this looks like somebody sprinkled pepper all over it because it's covered with so many fruit flies, fungus gnats, ants, anything you can get a hold of. What this plant does is it secretes a uh, nectar or a resin. The bug lands on the leaf and gets stuck. Once the plant senses the bug is on the leaf, it secretes a digestive enzyme which digests the bug right on the leaf and that's how the plant gets to its nutrients. Strawberries are now number one when it comes to produce that's contaminated with pesticides and herbicides. In this farm, we grow two different strains of strawberries and we have no bug problems here. We don't have to spray them at any point in their life to control bugs. If you go into a farm, you're looking at pesticides, herbicides, fungicide agents, extending agents, refrigeration, transportation, all of those costs aren't on our plate. And so we can take the money that's spent on petrochemical agriculture and pour that money into R&D and pour that money into sustainable energy solutions you know, that give us long-term value versus a monthly bill. We did almost everything here with items that you can buy at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. It's because our goal is to democratize the technology. We want other people to be able to do this. When we buy food locally, we employ people locally who then can spend that money locally. When we buy food from parts unknown, that money leaves, it never comes back. So you think about this, it just makes sense on every level for us to do this in our city. Thank you. Um, I just want to say um, thank you again uh, to Councilman Tallenberger. Uh, we went out to visit the location, the farm, Friday. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, a one visit is worth a thousand pictures. Even though this is a good video, it does not give you the total magnitude of what kinds of things are happening all at once. And the one thing that stuck with me, Councilman, um, in our visit, other than the strawberries and the wasabi, was that Philadelphia consumes the vast majority of food in Pennsylvania, but produces the least amount of food that is consumed. Um, and that economic paradigm is one of the reasons why we're here, uh, to try to create those jobs
to bring, um, they say to be green is the lo uh, shortest distance between growth and consumption. And if you do that, you accomplish a shade of green. So I want to thank you again for it. Well, 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 thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, I think we're, we're on to something very much so. There's a need. There's a place. And this will come out in the hearings. And one last thing from my perspective, I want to thank all my colleagues for being here today uh, to, to hear these uh, important things. Because this is job creation at its very best. And this is job creation at its embryonic start. And we're here to help you. Ms. Williams, would you then please read the first group to testify? Panel one will be City Controller Alan Buckovitz and Elise Roos Esposito. Thank you. Mr. Controller, welcome. Thank you. So why don't we start with you. Um, if it's okay with the panel, we'll hear all of the, uh, if it's okay with the committee, we'll hear all of the panel, and then we'll ask questions up, upon their conclusion. Seeing no objection, I want to recognize that um, Councilwoman Blackwell and Councilman O have joined us, and thank you for that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Chairman Curtis Jones and Councilman Al Taubenberger for inviting us here to testify about the potential of vertical farming to create substantial new economic activity in the city. It is clear to me, as it is for many others in this room, that the fiscal health of the city is deeply tied to its economic health. With a poverty rate greater than 25%, we need job growth for our future generations, and particularly among our most vulnerable adults, such as ex-offenders and veterans. Uh, my policy unit, under the leadership of Dr. Jeffrey Hornstein, who's beside me, uh, has been charged with discovering areas of greatest opportunity for job growth. We realize that, like other so-called post-industrial cities, Philadelphia is blessed with a very large and vibrant sector of anchor institutions like hospitals and universities. In fact, this sector represents about $14 billion in annual economic activity, including about $5 billion in spending on goods and services. However, most of these dollars leave the city. We reasoned that if we worked with these institutions collaboratively to figure out how to localize more of their spending, we could create thousands of jobs in fields such as manufacturing, distribution, and medical and professional services. Most of our anchor institutions have been working to positively impact their local communities for quite some time. We are helping to coordinate this activity on a citywide basis and to identify areas for collaboration across institutions. The leaders of every one of these institutions are deeply committed to our city and to local economic growth and development. I commend them all, particularly Penn's Amy Gutman, Drexel's John Fry, CHOP's Madeline Bell, and Jefferson's Steve Clasco for their leadership. With their cooperation, we published a report in 2015 that identified roughly $500 million in addressable opportunity for localization. In December 2015, we began convening regular meetings of the procurement directors of the major institutions and identified some concrete business opportunities. We learned that our hospitals produce 30 million pounds of medical laundry a year and that virtually all of it gets shipped over 100 miles every week to get cleaned. We also realized that every university and hospital spends millions of dollars a year on food, so we began to explore opportunities in these two areas. I was particularly pleased that Mayor Kenny and his Commerce Director, Harold Epps, recognize the job-creating potential of what we have come to call the Anchor Procurement Initiative. We have forged an innovative partnership this past year, developing our research into actionable development opportunities. This led us uh, to uh, the discovery for us of Metropolis Farms in South Philadelphia, which is spearheaded by Jack Griffin. Our team and I, along with some of you, paid a visit to Metropolis several months ago, and I was blown away by the demonstration farm that Jack and his team have built. Using components that seem mainly off the shelf from Home Depot, Jack has created an incredibly productive indoor farm growing greens, strawberries, peppers, and many other items. The technology at Metropolis is both revolutionary and simple. <coughs> the entire Metropolis workforce is local, mainly ex-offenders and veterans. The workers get paid a living wage to operate cutting-edge green technology. Metropolis is applying advanced manufacturing techniques to growing fresh produce. Thus far, our role has mainly been to persuade the anchor institutions and their food service providers to visit Metropolis and consider shifting some of their spending to this unique hyper-local farm. 
Metropolis has indicated that it is working with several major companies allowing them to finance the expansion into a much larger solar-powered warehouse in the next few months, greatly expanding its employment base as well. Jack apparently has plans both to expand Metropolis as a farming opposition and also to manufacture many of his components here in Philadelphia. This could create a new green tech industrial cluster with nearly limitless demand. <coughs> in closing, I commend Metropolis and others working in this space for their creativity and their business savvy. We hope that this will be the first of many successful ventures that grows out of the Anchor Procurement in Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Controller. Uh, pull the mic to you. Good afternoon. State your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Jones and committee members. My name is Elisa Roos Esposito, and I am the Farm Philly Program Manager at Parks and Recreation. I appear before you today on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation concerning Council Resolution Number 160386, authorizing the Commerce and Economic Development Committee to hold public hearings on vertical farming, hydroponic farming, and aquaponic systems in Philadelphia. Thanks to Councilman Taubenberger for introducing this resolution on the timely subject. Historically, Philadelphia City Council has demonstrated tremendous leadership and support for urban agriculture. The Department of Parks and Recreation has greatly benefited from your support. In 2012, we developed the Farm Philly program to support urban agriculture projects on parkland, as well as to build resource and education support for urban agriculture across the city of Philadelphia. Food production projects on a local level has many benefits from beautification, education, and supporting healthy choices for all Philadelphians to growing a crop for sale, also known as market farming. Market farming can create jobs and represents new entrepreneurs for our city. Due to the challenges and inherent limitations that exist when growing food in a city, urban agriculture and small farms are often the front lines of innovation in the, in the agriculture industry. By recognizing the importance and the need for innovative growing methods in an urban setting, I am here today to express my support for vertical farming, hydroponic farming, and aquaponic systems in Philadelphia. Economic and environmental challenges that face Philadelphia are all interwoven and need many innovative strategies to create new opportunities for our citizens. Vertical farming represents a new avenue for urban agriculture to repurpose previously vacant buildings, produce more food locally, boost our local economy, and create much needed jobs, as well as support the farm to table movement. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are you testifying? Are you? That's a wise employer employee relationship. Um, so, would you one. like to start? Yeah, I have one, and um, uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Controller Bukovic, uh, I, I had the opportunity to chat with the uh, Secretary of the USDA, Tom Viscali, and uh, under the current farm bill that exists, and uh, at least exists till 2018, there is funding for the USDA for urban farm financing and grants. One of the ideas I have is that we have someone working with the Commerce Department that can walk farmers and companies through their application and business plan draft process. One, do you think that is possible? And, do, and two, do you have any other specific ideas that the city could adapt to make this industry successful in Philadelphia? No, first of all, I think that's a great idea, very innovative. I know that uh, the Commerce Director has, has shown a commitment right. to these kinds of uh, endeavors, and uh, it's a question of extending his resources and his reach. He seems to be up for everything that, that's workable. Um, I, I think that what you're doing today is very helpful. I think people need to, to know about this. It is, uh, as Councilman Jones says, is an extraordinary experience. It's, it's a, uh, a semester's worth of education in a one-day walkthrough of this facility. Uh, the passion that Jack Griffin has brought to this, leaving a very lucrative uh, career line on Wall Street in order to do something that he really believes and which is something that is going to be of urgent demand in the world over the coming decades to be able to produce uh, large quantities of uh, very flavorful food in, in locations that, you know, while we're losing farmland all over Pennsylvania and in, in traditional areas that we're developing arable spaces and warehouses and places converting that to this use and on top of it the synergies that he creates the absolutely the idea that he's also capable of inventing new forms of cheap 
uh, electric power. Correct. And at the same time, provide entry-level employment for people who have a history of being ex-offenders. If, if he was excelling at any one of those areas, uh, it would be extraordinary. To do them all three means that you, he's operating at a, a, both a genius and a gifted capacity, and I think that indicates that he's going to have a lot more success than you would be able to measure in a linear way, because this is a project he really believes in, uh, he really knows, and uh, it's, it's going to put Philadelphia on the map in a number of respects as a leader in this field. Mr. Controller, you just actually reminded me something that, that, that I learned long ago when I was uh, uh, in the Agricultural College of Penn State University. And that is something that, that this could be of great help. The situation is as follows. The best agricultural soils in the state are also the best building soils, meaning you could build houses on them or buildings or cities. So there is great competition as our population increases to build on these very buildable uh, agricultural lands. But there run, runs the, you know, the risk of losing these agricultural lands, because once they're gone, they're, they're gone. And this is a way you know, to replenish. And uh, this is something where the city of Philadelphia should and could take the, the lead on. I was going to ask you one, one final question from my well, perspective. I, think, I, I mean, what we really have to do is get the word out to the yes. large supermarkets and the, uh, the distribution points and the restaurants. And I think that, uh, that the Vertical Farm has been doing a, a decent job of that, but uh, they're, they're really a relatively well-kept secret in Philadelphia. I think they ought to be in the food pages of the newspapers. They ought to be, Absolutely. Uh, so, so that anything that we can in terms of using our uh, promotional dollars, our tourism dollars, whatever we can to get the word out about this, because I think they've also taken the position of not just being a proprietary commercial enterprise. As, as was mentioned in the video, they are interested in developing this as a, as a replicatable, as a copyable formula for uh, people who don't have much capital but have an interest in the subject area. And I think the best thing that we can do is help them, help introduce them to potential large purchasers. What, what better uh, uh, trademark or, or marker that you could put on a, uh, uh, a lettuce or on, on basil? Homegrown in Philadelphia County. It's, uh, I think, amazing. It's, it's a very good thought as well. I do have one other question, and that would be, do you have any sense, Mr. Bukovitz, on the amount of uh, buildings that might be available for such use? I mean, in the sense of how many abandoned buildings do we have in Philadelphia? Well, we have many thousands. Of yeah. Factories, actually, not houses. I mean, we have tens of thousands of abandoned. So, so yeah. we certainly have the room. There's no question about it. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Oh, uh, Jeff Bernstein, I work for the controller as his policy director. Um, I just want to add one thing. What's innovative about our interaction with, um, with Jack and Metropolis under the controller's leadership and now with the Kennedy administration's partnership is bringing the the the, the already existing demand in this city. Jack has this great line that demand drives supply. So we have immense demand at the universities and hospitals, and we're working with our food service companies. You'll hear one today, the most forward-thinking one, Bon Appetit, talk about the way that they privilege local procurement. Everybody says they want to do local, but that usually means 200 miles away. We're giving people the opportunity through Metropolis and other vertical farms that might be developed here to take advantage, to tap into that tens of millions of dollars of demand um, and multiply jobs. Because it's one thing to, to sell a few, uh, a few packages of lettuce to a scene or even to Jeff Brown's shop, right? It's another to get into Aramark's supply chain, Bon Appetit's supply chain, um, Sodexo's supply chain. So that's really the innovative part of this initiative as an economic development strategy. And I thank Council for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about how these things connect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. A couple of questions, and I'm going to recognize my colleague, Councilman Graham. Are you, we need, I'm hoping, and you'll, you may tell me we are or that we can, work with the Commerce Department, work with the Redevelopment Authority to identify this inventory of underutilized buildings. Um, I know a couple of them in my district that have been vacant decades uh, that might be converted into these vertical farms. Uh, and the second part of that question is working with the industry to find out places where they can be grown or where they can't. So there might be some prior use 
that uh, asbestos filled, I can only imagine, that we create uh, a inventory of potential sites to develop. Uh, yeah, I think I think that would be uh, that would be a valuable course to pursue. It's really going to be driven by the entrepreneurs who are going to set up uh, these businesses. As Jeff pointed out, Jack has been very picky about the the real estate that he wants to choose, and uh, I, I, my suggestion is that we concentrate more on increasing the demand for these products. And as, as the Metropolis grows and other competitors begin to find it attractive, I'm, I'm very confident we in the Redevelopment Authority and Council will be able to, to identify appropriate venues and to work with those entrepreneurs. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilman Green and Thank then you. Councilman Dom. Thank you, Chairman Jones. Um, uh, Mr. Controller and Mr. Hornstein, I want to um, follow up on the conversations we've had extensively regarding uh, supply chain and development, especially when you talked about the Aramarks and others. And I guess my question is, what are some of the challenges uh, for uh, Metropolis Farms to be able to really engage from a procurement perspective with those type of entities, from a Sodexo, Aramark? Are they at the level or scale to really be a um, provider for those companies? Well, I mean, they're not at the scale right now where they could. I mean, what would take them? I guess my question more is more specifically, what would take them to get to that scale? Well, you want to talk? So I, I think what's exciting about Jack, I, I was involved in the vertical farming, farming space before coming to work in the controller's office, and most of the farms that I've seen are too small scaled. They, they might be able to supply a, a one of the dorm cafeterias at a university. Right. What's innovative about what Jack is doing is he's applying advanced manufacturing techniques to agriculture. So the scale problem is, is in some ways, a function of his ability to attract demand. I don't think he's going to have a problem scaling up to a million, two million, three million pounds. Um, the amazing thing, which I'm sure he'll talk about, is the, the cost that he's driven everything down to. They just built a vertical farm in Newark for about $40 million. Jax is going to be, and correct, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, something like $2 million. Right? It's a much more economic enterprise. The issue with getting in, and I'm sure Steve Scardina and, um, and Claire Calloway from Bon Appetit can address this a little more, what it takes to be of scale to get into Aramark or Bon Appetit supply chain differs tremendously by company. Aramark is more bureaucratic. Bon Appetit is less bureaucratic. They're m more open to local purchasing. So it, it really depends on building relationships with these companies. We're heartened that um, Maria Jandros from our staff has been doing a lot of work connecting um, to the institutional purchasers. And Aramark finally seems willing to sit down and talk to us. That's mostly because Temple and Drexel and Chop and others use them and, are sit and have asked them to sit down and discuss localism. Because everybody says they want to do this. Our job is to make it easier for them. So again, it's a scale problem, which I think Jack is, is addressing. And we're looking at that throughout the supply chain. How do we get local businesses to scale that they can actually get into these supply chains and have the meaningful multiplier effect that that can entail at its best? So let me follow up on a question. What role can a city play, and not so much with an Aramark or Sodexo, but for other institutions locally, like a Temple or a Penn, um, other who are providing food to their uh, employees to their students to make sure provide advocacy to enable uh, a Metropolis Farms other similar entities to become um, vendors for those uh, institutions. I think personally that what you're doing right now is incredibly important. Letting people know that you're watching the supply chain. Um, Harold uh, Epps, the Commerce Director, made it very clear at our uh, first procurement directors meeting of 2016 that the city this is of great interest to the administration. I think everyone hears that loud and clear, and I think all the institutions, first of all, they want to cooperate. Every one of them wants to be able to put out a local impact report that actually is meaningful and creates jobs. Um, the hospitals are mandated under the Affordable Care Act to show positive economic in impact in their communities to, um, to fulfill their ACA requirements. Hopefully that will remain. Um, and the, um, the city, um, has some leverage here because the institutions generally want stuff from the city. So I just think we're, we've developed what Lee Wong from e Econsult I think properly called the Philadelphia, Philadelphia model of collaboration and cooperation. What the controller and, and the commerce director brought to the table is, is the convening power. And now we're sitting down with these folks every few months and really checking in 
Maria's checking in with them weekly to see what the, the new next opportunities are. But I, plus, the, plus the city purchases food, or the city. Uh, I mean, the city runs the uh, correctional facilities and uh, nurse. Well, uh, other facilities that that purchase food, and I think um, giving a, a strong hint to some of the uh, the contractors there that this is something that. Uh, that they would genuinely find profitable and convenient for themselves, that they should take a, a trip down there and, and experiment with this would probably be uh, well received. Well, that's what I was going to drill down to. My, that was my next point to drill down to from the city's perspective, um, uh, where the city could participate. You know, often there are different ideas that come out and initiatives, and sometimes these initiatives um, take on a life of their own when the city decides to do a pilot with that initiative, um, or sometimes too often not, the city does not engage. And I think of Recycle Bank uh, many years ago, that was an initiative that was new to the city, started by a local person. Um, for whatever reason, the city would not engage Recycle Bank, and they ended up going to jurisdictions outside of the city, and eventually the city tried to do it on their own, not at the level that it could have been done if they had just done a pilot with Recycle Bank. And I think right. I don't want to see the same type of of problem um, go about. So I think as we go into January, we go into the budget process and we look at the uh, the prisons and other entities that um, buy food, uh, especially when you're talking about things like, like lettuce, and these are opportunities for the city to participate. Uh, I guess the last question, and I'll close, uh, are you familiar with the price, well you may not, but Jack probably does, the price point between um, their cost of produce versus other vendors. But I, I seem like a question that he probably would know. So no. I'll save that for him. You okay? Well, I would, <clears throat> and on, on Councilman Green's point, and we were, we were brainstorming. I think it's the vegetables, the oxygen up here is better. Um, that we should take a look at our schools. Um, that there are schools like Saul that both consume lunches, but also our agricultural right. in, uh, in origin can adapt some of this in a partnership with the farm to be able to replicate in some small way that co that that combination of uh, agro business. The other place is um, that that we should look to is our summer youth feeding program. We feed uh, hundreds of thousands of kids every summer, and yes, uh, it's good that they're getting something, but I would doubt the nutritional value um, compares to what can be given to them there. So locally sourced, again, uh, we have a contract with the city of New York to provide our kids food. We, we, we need to start to change that paradigm a bit. Are there any other questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank, thank you so much for your testimony. Ms. Williams, will you please read the names of, and titles of the next panel to testify? The next witnesses will be Jack Griffin, Park Shahan, Dr. Stephen Hughes, and Amy Black. I want to thank you all for your patience and uh, bringing this, uh, not new, but new to us, uh, technology um, to the city of Philadelphia in a big way. And it's, it is really okay today for Philadelphia to be first at things. And so we're okay with it. Thank you. You can begin your testimony in any order that you like, but state your name for the record so the stenographer can take it down. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jack Griffin. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? It's the next one. So today I'm, I'm supposed to be talking about a vertical farm. What we're really talking about is a vertical farming industry and developing and fostering that industry within our city. Um, I think it's, it's important to note, because we sometimes forget how important food is to our lives um, you know, and how powerful it, it can be. Aside from breathing, eating and drinking are the most repeated human experiences. 
where you look through religion. I don't care which religion you are. If you're, you're looking in the Torah, you're looking in the Bible, you're looking in the Quran, you're looking in some Eastern religion that I, I don't want to leave out. Um, you know, it's always going to be communal. It's always going to focus on food. Um, you know, from a, from a cultural perspective, in many cultures, when you say, how are you? What you're actually saying is, have you eaten today? You know, um, from an economic perspective, um, and I am, uh, my, my mind will always think as an economist, um, the transactional nature of food is the largest group of economic transactions in humanity, in civilization. There are more people paying for, deciding, working for, doing something on a transactional basis in food than in any other area of our lives. It's, aside from breathing, it is our most communal activity. Um, Philadelphia, as mentioned earlier, is the largest food buyer in the region and the largest food buyer in the state. We sell an enormous amount of food on the retail side as a result. But on the commodities-based side, we do almost nothing. Now, that presents a, a, an issue for the, the Aramarks and the Bon Appetits and the Cisco's and the Magic Specials of the world because even if they wanted to purchase food, where do they get it? So what's changed is cities have never been able to tap into this massive amount of green collar jobs because there hasn't been a technology capable of growing to the scale, the amount of food necessary to do it. Um, to give you some example of scale, uh, in Australia there's one particular farm, it's I believe 50 acres, which is approximately 2.5 million square feet. It produces enough tomatoes to feed every man, woman, and child in Philadelphia year round. We can do the same thing in about 300,000 square feet because of the vertical nature and the density nature of this technology. We just had testimony that there are tens of thousands of square feet of empty space. It's kind of a no-brainer to be able to look at a new technology and say, we can do better with this. Um, when you look at you know, the, the, the key to this, in my opinion, as, as everyone already recognized, is institutional demand. Um, as institutional demand goes, this industry will flourish. They're, they're, they're really, this is one of those things that's actually a no-brainer. Um, it will not cost any more to shift the institutional demand to local food than we're spending right now. There are a couple of advantages, though, that I'd like to point out. Um, one of those advantages, obviously, if you, if you have your universities, your hospitals, your prisons, um, your schools providing the food, is green-collar jobs. It's a term we love because it, it, you know, it, we're replacing the blue-collar jobs that we've lost with these new green-collar jobs that are supported by localized demand, so we know they're going to be there. And we also know they're not going to leave. We're not interested in building an industry in Philadelphia and leaving because Philadelphia is also our customer. When you look at other demand-based businesses, for example, Comcast Cable, awesome business that was built in Philadelphia. It's based on demand. I promise you, if you have a choice between eating and watching cable, you'll eat. You won't get real estate. You won't watch TV. You won't do any, you're going to eat before you worry about clothes, where you live, anything. I promise you, you're going to eat. It is the ultimate demand-based business. Um, because we are also, and this is uh, something that Mayor Kenny said that really stuck with me a couple of weeks ago. He said, successful cities steal from other successful cities good ideas. Our goal is to have every city in the United States and every city in the world steal this idea because we're going to manufacture this stuff here and ship it to them. And that creates another level of jobs, an important level. Um, but if I could just for a minute talk about the evolution of this industry so we understand it a little bit better. Um, can we slip to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so where did vertical farming start? You're going to hear a lot of people, you're going to see a lot of folks talk about this. They'll give you the positives, they'll give you the negatives. What I tend to do when I look at the negative guys is I, I, I tend to remember things like the, the day the Wright brothers flew, there were articles that they were never going to be able to fly. Um, you know, I remember that you know, through history, you look at uh, things like when the electric light bulb came out, the folks that had a self-interest in, in kerosene, 
the Rockefellers continued to put out articles stating that electricity was incredibly dangerous. It would never happen because people would burn alive. I, I respectfully remind people that kerosene is a close cousin to jet fuel. They were actually saying it's, sh it's safer to light your home with jet fuel than a light bulb because it was in their self-interest. We see that from time to time. We see folks whose knowledge may be a mile wide, but it's an inch deep. And they haven't spent the time. I know myself, as an, analyst, as an analyst, when I look at things, it's one thing. When I put on a pair of muddy boots for three years, and I work under racks, and I figure this stuff out, it's another. You have a much deeper understanding of it. Um, this started with the marijuana industry. Let's be honest. They, they, the original indoor growers were folks that That's didn't nice. want to get caught. So what, what happened along the way, though, is some amazing stuff. They realized they were growing better crops. They realized that those crops had a higher content of what they were looking for than came from an outdoor crop. They also didn't have any of the weather risk associated with it. So in January, I'm growing strawberries. In February, I'm growing strawberries. It's a strategic advantage over everyone else who's not growing anything and the land is sitting there unproductive all those months. So that's, that's an enormous advantage that we have and we owe that advantage to folks, the folks that came before us. The next era um, was that, because of course we know that no university professor or university person ever smokes marijuana, so they would have no idea that this was going on in the marijuana industry. Um, For the record, they don't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> so there was some bleed through, let's say, or some secondhand smoke that reached into the universities. Uh, and uh, then what happened from that point forward is these folks. What, what happened that really was the game changer in vertical farming was the Fujiyama earthquake. Everybody remember that one? Not that long ago. But it sent shockwaves through the world because when that earthquake went off, a nuclear, uh, a, a, a nuclear power facility cracked. And they didn't know if they were ever going to be able to use their soil again. Other governments took notice, and they started throwing huge amounts of money at the potential of laboratory-based grows. Um, we call that the laboratory farming era. Um, that's the era of the, the, the green monsters in, in, in Japan. Um, there's been a, 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 an enormous, I would call it a farm race for the world's largest vertical farm for a number of years. It, it bores me to death, to be honest, because I don't want to be the world's largest. I want to be the largest network of high-density farms dispersed throughout a community. We don't need giant farms. We need lots of farms. They, they make more sense there in a number of ways. Um, but you have to go through this. And I, I brought a prop that if I could just... Here it is. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember that. Okay, probably not. But I bought this, embarrassingly enough, in 1984. This is the world's most expensive cell phone. Swear to God, this cell phone cost $4,000 in 1984. That's 25% of the wages of someone's in, uh, yearly income in 1984. Today, it's almost $10,000 for this cell phone. You know what it does? Makes phone calls for a half an hour and the battery dies. That's it, okay? None of the other features, nothing. But this was state of the art in 1984, and it's the one that was in the movies and stuff like that. It's also that I'm probably going to be on a future episode of Hoarders. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, my point is, if we didn't go through this era, we wouldn't have this. Wouldn't be an iPhone. About just recently, there was a billion of these that went out. So I'm not knocking these guys. I'm trying to say that we have to go through the learning curve to get here. Now. At this point, we're closer to here than we are to here. That's the really good news. Um, if you look at the last world's largest vertical farm, the last world's largest vertical farm cost $39 million to build. And I'm going to tell you, it's gorgeous, all right? It, it really is. But they use 70,000 square feet to produce only 2 million pounds of produce. One question, who's paying the $39 million back? It's too much money, it's too much space, it's not enough food. Now we enter the commercial era. Last year when we came out with our tech and started proving it, started showing, got, getting a lot of excitement. 
because we can do more than two, millions, two million pounds of produce in less than 14,000 square feet on any floor of a building. That's for 20 times less money. Okay, so for less than two million dollars, I can produce what they did with 39 million dollars, and I can do it in 80 percent less real estate. That creates high density smart farms throughout a city that not just supports the produce needs of the city of, of, of that community, but also produces green collar jobs and a network of them at the same time. Um, the difference is that the new equipment is easy to build. Um, it, it's, it's easy to it's easy to it's easy to to, uh, to scale, and most importantly, it's easy to staff. The laboratory or equipment required someone with a college degree or better to operate the equipment. Our goal is to make this so folks with high school degrees can do it, or folks that have GEDs can do it. You can be trained and you can grow through the industry in order to be able to do this. We need that sort of scale in order to make it work. Um, there have been many other uh, examples of how we've moved this forward but from the most important perspective is we can produce a lot of food in a small amount of space for a lot less money um, but I did say I was going to talk about how we can turn this into an industry not just a farm so could we go to the next slide please the entire industry right now now we've talked about food production we talked about institutional demand. Now it creates green collar jobs. I, I don't want to beat, beat a dead horse. Everybody knows what we need to be able to make this move forward. You know, we've always worked on the issue of supply and demand. What I'd like to do is I'd like to talk, may, maybe change that paradigm a little bit and talk about demand and supply. Because in this instance, demand is far more important. Demand has a choice. You have a choice where you buy your food. You have a choice, right? And supply has a shelf life. So supply has to bend to demand in this instance. And the end result is a more prosperous city that has a velocity, what, as I'll use the fancy economics term, velocity of capital. We have the money continue to turn over within our communities versus just leave and just be sanitized and never be seen from again. That's the goal from a farming perspective. In addition to wholesome food, we don't need pesticides. We don't use herbicides. Um, we're, we, we, we absolutely refuse to use a GMO. It's unnecessary. All of those things are unnecessary, all right, because of the way we're growing. But the base of this pyramid, I think, is the place where we're going to see the most job growth, although there is an enormous amount of job growth in food production. The base of the pyramid, which is manufacturing and the bioscience portion of this. Now, it might come as a surprise but this is $10 million in letters of intent to build farms for other cities. Right in my hand right now. This is happening. So if we're looking at this from the perspective of saying, geez, how are we going to supply this demand? Because as, as Mayor Kenny had pointed out, successful cities steal from other successful cities. These are real jobs. These are manufacturing jobs right now. We made our equipment different from what you're used to. Uh, everybody else builds a vertical farm. It takes nine, 10 months, a year to build a vertical farm. We do it in a matter of weeks. Um, we've broken our system down into a modular system. What do I mean by that? Well, when you buy a modular home, you've got your foundation, you've got your utilities, and they pre-manufacture the home, they bring it out, and they drop it on site. Well, our, 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 our foundation is racking. It's metal racking. No reason for me to trek metal racking all over the country, all over the world. We give them the specifications, they build it. We tell them what the electric specifications, they do that. We pre-manufacture and bank all the parts here in Philadelphia, all of them. Um, we're making decisions on a daily basis and figuring out how we can get more and more control over those individual pieces. Um, uh, you know, a good example of that is what we've done with our lighting. Um, we started out like everybody else. We investigated every light. I was unhappy with it. My partner was immensely unhappy with it. And what we found is we developed our own lighting um, that is a little bit different. I'm just going to go grab it for a sec. First thing you'll notice is this is not an LED. Okay? This is our light. 
So why did I go to do this? Well, first off, LED lights are 40 to 60% of the cost of building a vertical farm. Our lights are a third of the cost of those lights. You're going to spend $1,500, you're going to spend less than $500. The next piece is that our lights produce twice the amount of light as the LED lights. And lastly, they use 20% less electricity than the LED lights. And they grow better plants. And I can back all that up. So that's the other portion of it. Um, this hood, for example, is German aluminum. We figured out how to do it without the German aluminum so that we can, we can manufacture the hood instead of, instead of weight labeling it. We figured out how we can manufacture it here in Philadelphia and create those jobs. I find a social value, my personal belief, um, best way I can describe myself is I'm a socially responsible capitalist. Okay? Believe in the capitalist system, but I'm socially responsible. And we'll be... So just... We like that here in these chambers. Our Democrats, our Republicans get along. We meet in the middle. Okay. Right? Very true. So, as a socially responsible capitalist, I don't see value in making a couple extra pennies by shipping this to China. I'd rather create a couple extra jobs. I'd rather take a page out of Henry Ford's book and say, geez, you know, you got to make sure your cars, the people that buy your cars can buy a car. Right. Make your car. We want people to be able to, to prosper from this, and there's a value in our city and a value to producing this stuff here versus, versus trying to find cheaper, cheaper, cheaper ways of doing it. I just want the best way where everybody can win. So building these in Philadelphia and building the rest of our systems in Philadelphia to us is a commitment that we like to make because we're asking you for a commitment. We're asking the city to help us produce this, fill a demand that exists. Um, and to me, the, the least we can do is stay here and do what we're supposed to do and create the jobs, the jobs here versus someplace else. Imagine how many cities need this. I mean, I, we didn't even try to get $10 million in letters of intent. I made a few phone calls and they just started pouring in. I have people in San Francisco and in Toronto that have offered to prepay for their farms because they want them built now, because they want them built as fast as possible. Canada has a huge problem when it comes to food. There's also an enormous amount of activity in the corporate world. This is a partner we're working with who has just gotten multiple contracts for hundreds of millions of gallons of bio jet fuel. Now, it seems a little far afield from food, but it's agriculture and it's the optimization of a product. So we've set up a pilot production facility and we've already shown that we can grow six times more biodiesel and bio jet fuel than anybody else in a field. And the beauty of this is instead of these jobs going off to, this one contract is for 30 million gallons to jet blue. It's the one that's on top there. But instead of taking those jobs and having them leave and go to North Dakota to some field where they move the refinery out there, why not do it here and produce our energy? Why? It's a neat idea. You know, how many, em again, empty buildings, filling them up, creating those jobs, and fulfilling a real opportunity that exists. We're working with uh, another international corporation on Stevia. Stevia is going to become a very big thing in 2018, right? From a Wall Street perspective, I tell you in 2018, Check sugar prices because they're going to drop. The reason sugar prices are going to drop is because the new labeling requirements with the federal government now require every company, to t every company that manufactures food to tell you how much added sugar is in each product. And when you look at your ketchup and you go, there's two and a half teaspoons of sugar added to that ketchup. That's a, lot of ca that's, a, that's a lot of sugar. Maybe you won't want that. Well, that's what corporations are worried about right now. So they're looking for an alternative where they won't have to report that, right? That's corporate. You start looking at things like that. You start, I, I, we, we have another group that's working on, believe it or not, Chinese medicine. And I think it would be a pretty cool idea to take jobs back from China because most of those herbs are grown in China. They could be grown in South Philly. Why do they have to be grown in China? So. That's, that's, that's the types of projects that we're looking towards. And each of those gets, drives manufacturing more and more. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The single most important thing
for the vertical farming industry, aside from localized demand to survive and to thrive, is a ubiquitous, universal platform that everyone grows off of. Think about it like this. If we went back to the late, late 1980s, I believe, if there was 55 different types of computers, there would have never been a Microsoft. There never would have been a computer because everybody would be vying for their own system. Right now in vertical farming, you've got a bunch of people with um, homegrown home systems and uh, proprietary this and proprietary that. What we really need is a Swiss Army knife. What we really need is that universal, I just want to push the button on the copier. I don't care whose name's on the copier, but it's got to spit out a copy. Okay? If the platform is the same, then we can all work on it. A guy that works in South Philly can go to West Philly. A guy from West Philly can go to Harrisburg or to Pittsburgh or to Chicago. And it creates that ability for people to work everywhere. We have that system. That's one of the reasons folks are so interested in what we have, because it's a universal grow system that works for non-flowering, flowering. flowering. Um, name a type of crop we can grow. We've even messed around with little trees just for fun, just to show we can do it. Um, that has an advantage. Other advantages is the modularity. Instead of spending nine months with the carrying cost of capital for nine months to build a farm, your farm goes up in days, and you're farming in days. That's, that's valuable. Um, some of the technological advances, some of my friends uh, worked at NASA, and that has had a huge impact on the way I looked at things. Um, we, we created uh, a system called HotSwap. In the vertical farming business or in any, any hydroponic farming system business, your worst day is when your pump blows. Because when your pump blows, you're going to spend a day sucking all that water out, getting everything done. You're shaking your head over there. You know what a nightmare that is. All right? Not with us. Because we figured out how to isolate the pump and replace it in two minutes. So that's valuable. When you look at a tray and you have all the trays working, well, what if you need to work on one tray? You turn it off while the other trays continue to work. We created something that works for manufacturing. Councilman, did you have a question? Because your light's on. Oh, okay. Um, so that is why there's such a demand for this, because they, they really, they, they're really looking for it. The last piece of this, now we've talked about the hardware. Hardware is great, but you need a software to go with your hardware. All right? Um, hardware is interesting, but now you start looking at the fact that there's an opportunity to engage in that last portion, natural optimization farm. We're in the process of converting, actually, our original farm into a laboratory farm to specifically look at crops like those strawberries. They went through an optimization. That basil went through an optimization. Didn't start out the best basil we could find. We made it into the best basil. We figured out what the plant needed and grew it to its optimum ability. That is a valuable piece of intellectual property, number one. It also alleviates for the farmer the, the guesswork so that they're calling down an application, all right, from the cloud, believe it or not, to be able to operate that farm. And they'll be able to grow what they want to grow but not have to worry about having an on-site agronomist to figure things out for them because it's all pre-figured out. That has an enormous value to people that just want to grow food. You know, I, I look for the day when we can democratize the technology to the point where someone says, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a farmer. And I want to do it in the city. And I want to make that easy for them to do because that's how we explode the industry. That's how we make it as big as possible. But having the, the, the bioscience portion of this allows us to engage Philadelphia's other huge resource which is our university minds. Being able to say to them, right now, imagine you had the internet, but it was only on a blackboard. Well, what if, what if it couldn't go anywhere? Well, right now, they have no platform through which to write these algorithms. We're giving them that platform and turning it loose so they can write these algorithms and we can engage everyone to be able to create better food that better fits our society. So. Those are the three portions of how this works, and, and here's where we are in 2017. If you could please switch to the next slide. I'm almost done, guys. I'm sorry. It's taken so long. Um, you may recognize the two folks that are with me um, up there. That is the largest solar array, private solar array in Philadelphia. It's already up. 
It's also the site of our next location. It is the first solar-powered vertical farm in the world. That alone puts Philadelphia on the map as a hub of vertical farming on an international basis. Um, we've had many visitors. We've had uh, the, con uh, the controller's office. We've had, we've had many of, uh, of council up there. Um, we expect to be up and running um, by February of 2017. Our goal is for this particular farm, institutional demand for universities and hospitals. The other day, after uh, a lot of hard work, we, we just also got um, a uh, Best Buy from Whole Foods, which is, if it, you know anything about how hard that is, it's like being a five-star restaurant. Um, so we were pretty amazed, and you know, it was a lot of hard work to be able to get there, but we're going to be supporting them shortly, as well as to Bruno's, a scene, and a number of other supermarkets. Um, you know, but the purchasing power of the nine Whole Foods stores locally pales in comparison to the opportunity that we're working on right now with the University of Pennsylvania and Bon Appetit. Um, those are amazing opportunities. Those will drive the future of this. Um, we're planning additional farms, of course, throughout Philadelphia. Um, the demand is pretty bottomless when you think about how much. Think about it like this. When I started this, and, I, I, and my partner and I used to go out and talk to people and try and just get them to try the food. We used to say to them, you know, I'll give you the, 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 the best reasons to use. Let me give you the seven best reasons to use this. September, October, November, December, January, February, and March. Because you're not getting food locally anyplace else. We're it. Um, we'd like to extend our technology in the future to people like Greens Grove Farms, people like Bartram Gardens. Um, uh, you know, I did say socially responsible. We, we have no problem working with one of my partners is David Griffith, if you're familiar with David Griffith. Um, he runs Episcopal Services and a number of other charitable organizations. Um, he's going to be speaking, speaking later. He's, he's, uh, he's been a, an enormous help in, in creating a vision where we can in, be inclusive of the nonprofit world with the for-profit world in such a way where everyone benefits and our city as a whole benefits. So, I mean, this is an important thing to be able to do um, from that regard. Um, you know, uh, just as an aside, relative to solar power and relative to the things that we're doing, like one of the things we're doing here is we're, this is a 100,000 square foot roof. Well, we calculate that this roof will produce 2 million gallons of water a year. Right now, let's go into the watershed. Um, we're working with, with folks in the city right now to have that 2 million gallons go into, go into the plants instead. So instead of, instead of wasting that water and actually causing a problem, let's get that water inside the plants. Start thinking about all the roofs in Philadelphia that could benefit from a solar array. Because unlike residential solar arrays, we use the electricity. And since we use it, we're not giving it back to the grid at a penny per... Th penny per thousand kilowatts? Right. Penny per thousand kilowatts. What do we pay for electricity? Nine, ten pennies per, per, per kilowatt? Okay, so think about that. There's a disparity there. If you use it, it's great. Achieving a lease on a solar array, the reality is you're going to look at the cost. It's going to be 2.5 cents or less per kilowatt versus, versus nine or ten. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good proposition, spreading it out and harvesting the sun from the roof and harvesting the rain. Why not? It doesn't hurt us. It makes good fiscal sense. If we could go to the, the next slide, please. Well, manufacturing we're calling the farm works, and we, we need to open this as quickly as possible. We're actually, right now, we've, we've uh, raised some funding. We're looking for more. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is what the industry needs. Um, uh, right now we're searching for, for more space and we're hiring key staff. We're hiring the core people to build the systems um, and you know, we're pleased to do this right now. Um, right now we have two large farms in Toronto and San Francisco. One, the San Francisco farm is on Treasure Island if you're familiar with the Bay Area. Um, it's an island underneath the Bay Bridge, it's kind of cool. Um, and, uh, for example, in that particular farm, we're going to use the Pacific Ocean to cool the water for the plants. We're going to suck, because if you've ever been in the Pacific Ocean, you know it was wrongly named. It should be the violent, so cold, I can't stand it ocean. Um, so we're going to suck the water. It's called a slack system from the Pacific, run it through a, a circulator, 
and then dump it back into the Pacific at a higher level. The net, co net difference is we're going to save about 90% on the cost of energy for doing that by putting in a pump and some tubes. So it's, it's, it's a lot of this, and I, I've said this many, many times, a lot of what we've done is fourth grade math and freshman year geometry. It's all it really is. It's just applying it and finding the best way. Um, the prepayment helps us an awful lot because those two folks are going to make it possible for us to build faster. The, the more opportunities we have, uh, uh, my biggest nightmare is I don't want to become a gazelle. If you're familiar with that term from the, from the 90s finance world, uh, a gazelle is an animal that can run so fast it can outrun a lion. But its brain can't keep up with its legs. It trips and the lion eats it. I don't want to get eaten, so we're growing at a very specific, responsible business pace. I, I must get, and I, I'm not exaggerating if I were to say, we get 30, 40 requests a week for employment. Um, we have people that want to work for free over and over again, and we don't have jobs for them yet. We intend to. We, we hold on to all these names. Um, but you know, we can only grow at a pace that the demand is with us and the finances work. And, and I think that, that everybody up here would agree with that, that that's one of the issues we all have. But the goal from the farm works perspective is to do the manufacturing for the world from here. What we're manufacturing is lightweight, it's easily shippable, it's modular, so it becomes very, very easy to build these things and be able to do that. Um, next slide. Next to last slide, thank you. The optimization farm is an enormous opportunity for our city. No one in the world is focused on creating a, 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 the software algorithms for a platform to grow. All right, that's the iPhone of this thing. Being there, being able to take that portion of the bioscience world and do that, leveraging the university minds we have in the Philadelphia region, I was with uh, some, of the, uh, some of the senior professors at um, uh, Penn State the other day. And um, the first thing out of their mouth was, well, what can we do? And I told like, the guy, you could just see the look on the guy's face, and I said, well, we need you to help us write these algorithms. We need to find the best way to grow these, this food. Food has different expressions. Last year, for example, I grew tomatoes, and I had a little bit of fun with them. I decided that I wanted to take capsaicin, which is the stuff that makes peppers pepper, and I made a pepper tomato. All right? These things are possible. And that's not a GMO. That was just flavoring the tomato. Okay? We can do that sort of stuff, um, especially if we can leverage the minds that exist for this. I mean, I, uh, you know, my team is pretty good, but there are other good people out there, and we want to work with them. We're working in an, in a, in a, in an inclusive environment, not an exclusive environment. Um, these crop applications create an opportunity for intellectual property and, and real financial value. Um, from, from the perspective of, of uh, you know, from, from our perspective. Some of the things that we've uncovered and determined um, in terms of managing farms, uh, for example, one of the bits of technology that we're working on right now makes it possible to run a hundred farms from a single location. Um, if you remember from the 90s, uh, everybody hated their IT guy because he was like a fireman in a firehouse. Unless you had a fire, you really didn't need him. Well, if, if you've got these very intelligent, smart folks that have to go from farm to farm doing this work, it's less efficient than having them in one pop center do everything uh, and, and stay in a city, whereas we're then servicing all these other farms from that location. That took the, the concept of an acquisition for our company, because one of the ways you always look at a corporate situation like this is, could we go public? Yes, we're looking at going public eventually. Could we... Could we wind up in a stock swap situation? Well, prior to these technologies, the stock swap would have been somebody like John Deere. Now it's somebody like Tesla. That's the people that would be looking at us at this point. Um, not thrilled, not, not looking to sell anytime soon, but it's nice to be wanted. <laughs> I have to tell you that. It's nice to have these folks tracking us for a change. Um, you know, the, the last slide, please. So, how can the city help? Well, the institutional demand 
is obviously the, is, is really the key thing. I'm, I'm in a room full of people that know exactly how to help. You guys, you guys encourage businesses all the time. Your business leaders, your, your, your folks that know how to do this. You know, um, you could probably guide us better than we can guide you with that regard. We're a new industry, and it's not just me. It's the rest of the folks sitting at this table as well. I mean, Amy's, Amy's organization is the oldest, I believe you're the oldest urban farm in Philadelphia, probably in the country, I think, one of, in Philadelphia. Um, the lady that ran it was, uh, was in Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential women in the United States. Um, they do an amazing job. They have over 40 employees. I'd love to be able to make sure they had our technology so they could grow year round and help everybody else with this as well. Um, that's the directions that we need to go in. Um, so whatever appropriate help there could be, we certainly would like it. I would like to, and, I, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, one of the things that I'd really, really like to do with this is I'd like to build this within a prison. I'd like to give these guys an opportunity. You know, we've been doing that. We've been doing outreach between veterans and ex-offenders, and I think it's something important to our city. And it's like one of the reasons we're a poor city is because of the recidivism rate. When someone gets out of a prison, you're not just, you're not just stopping them from getting a job when you don't give them a job. You're, you're stopping their kids from having a life. We've got to stop that. And one of the ways to stop it, in my opinion, is giving them opportunities where they can learn how to do something that translates into a real um, sustainably, sustainable wage job. People should get paid $15 an hour for their work. You know, we need to get there. We need to be able to do those things. Um, you know, I think that if we do this together, we can build a better city, a stronger city. And, 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 and that's, uh, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, we're going to depart from waiting until all of the other committee members testify. We want to kind of drill down on you a little bit. Um, first and foremost, thank you for the innovation and being out front on this. Thank you for working with our colleague here um, to do that. Um, you talked about a great many things, employment. Uh, technological innovations on light bulbs to uh, actually feeding folk in a network of smaller farms, uh, all of which um, are intriguing to us. Is there an association of vertical farmers somewhere? Are you guys organized in a collective think tank way, exchanging them? It, or are we at the point in the industry where Henry T. Ford didn't talk to uh, Etzel. Uh, there is an association, and it should it would be more apt to be called an association of vendors that want to make money off of vertical farmers, um, it, which typically happens in these situations. It's, it's a bunch of vendors. Unfortunately, I've, I've, I'm not a member. I, I don't knock them. But um, there's no real transfer of knowledge um, we're among the most open group in terms of being able to say, sure, take a look at what we're doing. Maybe it can help you. Um, our intellectual property is very, very tight. Um, I, I'm very confident in our IP, and our IP is all patented. So that's, you know, so I'm, I'm more comfortable there. I'm also, I also use... And everybody else may not be? Well, you know, a lot of the folks involved in this started it because it was a really good idea, but, you know, it, there's an expression, uh, it takes a village. Well, to build a vertical farm, you need a diverse team of experts. Um, many of these farms were built by an individual who might be a, uh, an excellent farmer or an excellent businessman, but you don't find all these people together in one room. You know, you don't find the financiers. We've got a guy that works with us that was a CEO of mining companies. He just recently rang the bell on, on NASDAQ. Um, we, we have um, a lady who's a um, phenomenal financial mind. She's, uh, uh, I, I always say she was with E&Y, but it, she's going to correct me. What is it? PwC. PwC, sorry. I always say E&Y, sorry. Um, we've got a number of people. We've got my partner um, who, believe it or not, is a rock star um, in the electronic house music business uh, that world. Um, uh, he's Taurus from Taurus and Vigili. You've got a diverse group of folks. My partner was also, um, he's, he's not telling any secrets. He's uh, Lee Weinker is a brilliant botanist. So, so do you guys meet somewhere like on a farm and 
Um, I mean, I'm, well, the, the biggest organization in the area is, uh, respectfully, is the, the Philadelphia Society for the Advancement of Agriculture. There um, is a, there is it's a uh, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. I'm actually a member. Russell Redding, the Secretary of Agriculture, actually, uh, and, and you know, the Secretary of Agriculture actually nominated me. I think I'm the, I am the token non-PhD in the room, um, but they're a brilliant group of people that affect policy in the United States. I, I, I'm actually presenting the vertical farming to them later in the year. When I came into this industry, when I first was introduced to it, it's, it's, you have to understand, it was only three years old. That's what and I'm, that wasn't that long ago. So I'm trying to get on the linear timeline where we are. So the answer is early, and I'm, I'm guessing. Yes. So, so the question becomes, and, and I, I almost don't want to make a public statement about it. You know, it, it, we, you know, we're government, and the worst things you want to hear from us, we're here to help you. Like, you really don't want us helping you in some sense. And here's why. Because we don't know what your industry standard should be right. because only one up, uh, of us up here is a, an agronomist, and that's Tallenberger. The rest of us may be third-generation farmer, which has been a while since those fingers have been in the soil. <laughs> so, so my point is we need you to meet to tell us, well, this model of doing it is not as good as that one. You sure. need to be aware of this because they're bioengineer. We don't know all of the questions to ask more or less the answers. And some, you know, the beauty of this job is listening to experts. And so you, we, there is an onus on you guys to kind of come up with the industry standards to say that, um, so, so you explain the difference between the strawberries. Sure. Um, and I taste the difference between the strawberries. But if we label it one way, there's a truth in advertising thing Absolutely. that you need to kind of help us with. So, so as we're looking for, as you're looking for help from us, we're also looking for a, sure. a, a standard from you. So that's that's my my question. Who do we? Councilman. Yes. What I, but this is one of the reasons why we became the first vegan certified farm in North America because we wanted a standard. And the, the story behind that is I went to the three leading vegan organizations in the United States. Two of them just wanted to check. The guy, that, the guy that said, no, go away, don't call me again, is the guy I pursued for a year, okay? I was more interested in somebody with teeth than yeah. somebody who just wanted money. And you also are doing, as I recall from the, our visit, the first kosher. Yes, we're working on that right now with my, my partners. Uh, we're, working on a, we're working on a kosher solution right now. Um, because it's important to the Orthodox community to have food that's free of bugs. And we're working towards, what we, they were frankly stunned the first time they saw the system because they had never seen anything that was that clean. Um, and we're, we're going through a number of tests with them right now. We, we're very positive about the fact that we can satisfy that need. And it's, 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 a, it's a significant need um, to, 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 that, to that group to be able to have that sort of produce because otherwise they have to spend literally hours washing their food before they eat it. So I'm going to pass the mic to O uh, and then uh, Don. And then Green? Is your, yeah, yours is it too. So they didn't get a chance to. I know you're the best dressed. You ain't got to look at me like that. You see I have a complex, right? Councilman O. All right. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's very educational, very interesting. And so, you know, as I kind of digest it all, um, it's, uh, of course, way over my head. So, so I just have a few questions, um, and they're not at all kind of in line with what you talked about because okay. I'm just taking sure. what you said. Uh, but I have a couple of uh, just curiosity points. Um, so first, in terms of what you're doing, which sounds like you're trying to, at the end of the day, make um, vertical farming something that is very economical, feasible, and then you're looking at it from the manufacturing end of, I suppose, um, uh, providing the wherewithal for, for folks to set up their ver vertical farms. And the cost of energy is something that you talked about a lot. And um, so, for example, the light bulb that you're using that you talked about, how did you get that light bulb? Well, what we did is we looked at existing stuff that was out there. We adapted a calcium, a, um, 
a ceramic metal hydride bulb from Phillips, which is produced, by the way, in New Jersey to vertical farming. Um, and then we, 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 we built it the way we built it with a, uh, a low, a low, call, a low um, energy ballast that solved some other problems. It was more or less a question of putting the right parts together to achieve a lower energy coefficient than, than what happens with an LED. The LEDs, they do a lot of good stuff, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking LEDs for everything, but for growing plants, if you have quanta energy dropping down 100 constantly on a single point, we have a corollary in nature for that. We call it a desert, okay? Our lights are on robotics, they move. Um, we found ways to reduce our energy costs, not increase them. Um, and you have to remember when you're balancing us against a traditional farm. Well, the traditional farm is using pumps to push water. They use refrigeration. We don't need refrigeration. They are transporting their food thousands of miles. In fact, it wouldn't be unfair to call the current traditional agriculture petrochemical agriculture. You're using pesticides created from a petrochemical, herbicides, same thing, fumigation agents, refrigeration, all that stuff. When you balance it against what we use, uh, so, we're using far less. So could I ask you, if, uh, if you're going to compete with um, uh, another manufacturer producing the modules mm -hmm. uh, and, and they can drive down their costs, what, uh, My are, system, are you competitive in that sense? Well, first off, from a food perspective, we're over 100% internal rate of return. We're, we're financial people. We look at finance, okay? So you make money when you build a farm. That was okay. number one, all right? If you don't make money building a farm, you're not going to make any money selling farms, all right? Um, we are so below the cost of the industry right now for building a vertical farm. It's silly. Um, if you look at uh, one, one guy is building containers and... You know, I know you're doing containers too, but, but, but you know what I'm talking about that's selling them for 85,000 bucks? Yeah. All right, so he produces 500 heads of lettuce a week from a system that costs $85,000. All right, I do that in one level. I do that in one 36 square foot tower. So, for okay, example, so we're much um, more efficient. And by the way, my system right. costs, I don't know, three times less, four times less. Yeah, I, listen, I, I really got your testimony, um, mm -hmm. and it's very impressive. Uh, but, for example, when you buy the Philips light bulb, what is the lifespan on that light bulb? Okay, lifespan on the light bulb is approximately two years. And here's the argument and the counter argument. They're going to tell you the LED is no. going to last you five years. Only an idiot wants five-year-old technology. Buy your computer today and, and promise me you're not going to get a new computer or a new cell phone for five years. Okay? You don't want to pay $1,500 for a light and justify it because it lasts five years. Because in two years, there's going to be something better, right? There's a curve to that. And so I, I, I understand the argument that, yes, this, this technology. Also, when my light bulb breaks, you're out 70, 80 bucks. When their light bulb breaks, you're out $1,500. You know, the, the risk associated with it just isn't worth it. Um, another advantage, when you buy that $1,500 array, it will only do vegetative growth. In other words, it won't do flowering. You got to spend another $1,500 to do flowering plants, which is why you see all these farms with these short little plants and this on it. With us, you buy another $70, $80 bulb, and in four seconds, convert it to do flowering. Okay. So there's advantages, and I, I, I just believe that technology is changing so rapidly, you don't want to invest in something like, like I said, if you bought your iPhone and I said you got to keep it for five years, you'd buy another phone. Okay, my, my last question um, uh, is the, the art, artificial lighting you've indicated could grow more, I would in the layman's way just say more nutritious or more potent vegetables. We can test vegetables. it proof. That's um, not even... That's so even so the issue about the sunlight, that is not a critical issue in the growing of the well, plants? The plant grows with a specific set of nanowaves. We've known this in science for many, many years. And the objective is to is to reach that specific set of nanowaves and grow it as naturally as possible. Um, there's a set of waves that grows vegetative growth. And the objective here is always to mirror um, nature. Now, one of the questions that I got, and I used to get inundated on Facebook, um, when we announced our technology, uh, a, uh, one of the top economists in the world is a friend of mine, a guy named Martin Armstrong. I'm, I'm going to say the answer is yes, because I know my colleagues oh, have sorry. got questions and a whole lot of witnesses, but thank okay. you so much. Ch 
chair recognizes Councilman Don. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And uh, thank you for your testimony today. Thanks thank for you. coming in. I have a few, five or six quick questions that only have quick answers to. Okay, I promise. Um, <laughs> the, the first question, I was reading in your information, it says more food using 20 times less money. Yes. So the way I understand that is if the current head of lettuce in a store costs a dollar, your head of lettuce costs five cents? Actually, I was talking about the capital expense to set the farm up. Okay, so let we're me We're comparable you price with the stuff in the stores. Uh, we can, you know, there's a, a, yes, we're selling it to Bruno's, and the Bruno's sells our product for a premium price. But um, as a conversation I had with Jeff Brown, very quickly, um, we talked about rich people food versus poor people food. And my argument is there's no such thing. Um, food is a function of where it's sold and the packaging that it's put in. Um, if you want to buy it for less, you can go to the hood and pick it up there. And we can sell it for less because we don't have to put it in a fancy packaging and we don't need that much of our profit. We, our price is obviously flexible to the economics of a community. So I'm just trying to understand, you're saying the cost of a head of lettuce in the store is yours is the same? Same as anybody else. But if it, why would it be the same if it's 20 times less in the infrastructure? And 80 20 times price? less to, like I said, the capital expense, the expense to build the farm is what Building. I was referring to. Okay. Um, it costs $39 million to build the same amount of production in Newark. We're at $2 million to produce actually more production than that in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, how many vertical farms, just yours in Philadelphia right now? Or yes. Others? You're the only one. And, and we're building the second one right now. Okay. Are any current restaurants purchasing from you? Yes. Center city? Suburbs? Um, actually, uh, one of your tenants. Um, uh, we're going there later today. Uh, Chef Pierre. Uh, uh, it used to be called Cork and... Crown and, Crown and Cork. Harp and Crown. Yeah, it's going to become the... It's becoming uh, barrels. Um, we're building a vegetable tower, actually, in their restaurant. Um, we just finished the design the other day. So they're going to be able to... to grab the produce right from, it's going to be grown in their restaurant. Um, so we're doing that right now. All right, let me just mention one other thing, because you mentioned people who are working in your company are earning in their $15 an hour range. Yes. I want to make sure that you and everybody else knows about the Earn Income Tax Credit. If I didn't say this, my colleagues would give me a hard time. <laughs> That's right. Uh, last year, just so you know, the city of Philadelphia left $100 million on the table that could have gone to 40,000 families that qualify people. And so an example, $43,000 of income, single with two children, 49000 of income, married with two children, the checks can be up to $6,000. The average refund, 2400 This is federal money. Right. And you can file back three years. So everyone working for you, should, you should have them fill out any ITC qualifier and any, anyone else who's working there. Okay. It's free money. Take advantage of it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Always consistent. Uh, chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Vice Chairwoman Parker. Uh, Mr. Griffin, it's a pleasure to see you again. I had a chance to visit uh, your operation, I think, over the summer and had a chance to try some of your great strawberries. Um, and um, as Councilman Jones, I am technically a third generation farmer. Um, uh, but I just had some questions in reference from, because you were talking with Councilman Down about the um, just the production costs and actually development, I'm sorry, development costs of a farm, but I'm curious more on the operational side. Uh, and you said you can price the head of lettuce based on where, whatever dynamic. What gives you the flexibility to do that? Well, we have a larger margin. Um, we're not using pesticides. Right. They cost money. We're mm -hmm. not using herbicides. They cost money. We don't need refrigerated trucks mm -hmm. because we harvest and deliver the same day within mm -hmm. a matter of minutes. Um, those things cost money, and so when you look at my balance sheet, you look at my profit and loss statement, you're going, well, where are these costs that every farmer has? We don't have them. So on your P&L, so you're, you're looking at your expenses, um, your operational expenses in reference to water, energy, Very staffing, low. how does that compare to a traditional farm? So like, for example, for the, for the size um, farm, if you would take your space and compare it to a traditional farm of a similar size, what would you say the difference in costs between it would be um, hard to the pesticides, it. transportation, oh, okay. um, other, other issues like um, 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 crop rotation, all those type of dynamics compared to your um, operation? Okay. Well, it, look, in the area of water, water uh, typically in a farm, we use 98% less water. Um, uh, nut uh, nitrogen, when you put nitrogen on a field, you put about 200 acres per two tons. I had to go through this exercise mm -hmm. with Whole Foods. 
Um, we use, instead of two, 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 uh, 200, eight, 200 pounds for two tons, we use 0.222 pounds. That's it. Um, you know, uh, so what winds up happening is a, an average farm has a profitability, if they're lucky, of about 30%. Mm -hmm. The real advantage is that what we're doing that they're not is that we're producing, they're producing 2.5 crops a year. That's it. We're producing 18, 20. In the case of microgreens, which sell for $40 a pound, by the way, wholesale, um, in the case of microgreens, we're getting, um, I believe, a crop every five days, you know, which is a staggering amount of produce in comparison to what can be done outdoors. So that's our strategic advantage. So we're at well over 100% return on investment, which means that you know, the volatility and pricing that everybody has, we don't have that volatility. The, one of the things that's attractive, by the way, to us, or to uh, people like the Bon Appetits of the world with us, is that they're used to their pricing doing this, whereas we can say, well, we'll give you a mm -hmm. steady state Consistent. price throughout the entire year, so they don't have those problems. Mm -hmm. But uh, to answer your question, average farm, if they're lucky, good year, and there's no freeze damage or crop damage, mm -hmm. they're about 30% profitable. All right, we're our, our, we're at a hundred more than a hundred percent internal rate of return. Okay, um, we're, we're, if I could, Councilman, yeah. we're going to go back to the rule to let the other people testify, uh, many of whom have traveled a great right. uh, distance to be that. So hope don't go anywhere. Oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. don't take your phone. We'll be right back. Who's next? Hi, uh, my name is Parth Chohan. I'm the CEO and founding farmer of Homegrown Farms. Uh, and a lot of my testimony actually works really well with what Jack's uh, already talked about, what's already been said. And that's actually the first time we've met, so I think that kind of illustrates that this is kind of a collaborative environment, a uh, pretty cohesive community, and there's a lot of potential for people to work together from the business side, from production side, manufacturing. Um, Homegrown Farms, I started the company earlier this year. We are utilizing indoor... Um, excuse me, indoor technology in um, shipping containers. So we use hydroponics, uh, slightly different. I mean, the technical terms I don't think are necessarily too um, important right now, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you uh, because I think it's only through a strong collaboration between government and businesses that we can really make Philadelphia one of the leaders in the indoor farming space. Homegrown is currently working on developing a small warehouse farm in North Philadelphia, and we do want to see certain items addressed as we uh, you know, continue to increase our capital investments. We want to know what Philadelphia sees for itself when it kind of grows up in the urban and indoor farming uh, community. Are we going to be a production-centric city focused growing as much as possible in a city? Uh, are we looking at becoming more supportive of research, things like manufacturing and figuring out how to optimize? Are we going to try and create the next wave of urban farmers that can go out into other cities, into other communities? Or is it some combination of all three? As indoor farmers, we want to know what the city wants to see so we can adapt and grow accordingly. Uh, Philadelphia has a lot going for it. You know, we have a great restaurant scene. It's growing and it's getting more and more accolades. We have environmentally conscious consumers and we have numerous potential institutional clients. At the same time, we need to make sure that there's certain roadblocks that we can have proactively removed. Uh, things like making sure that planning and zoning or ordinances in various districts are mitigated. At the least, even some physical support from City Hall uh, at planning and zoning meetings would be greatly appreciated from young and cash grab businesses like my own. Another initiative that Homegrown would like to see is an increase in opportunities for students of all ages, not just in college but in high school as well, to get involved in the indoor farming businesses. I've learned so much from my experiences with uh, internships as well as just starting the company. And I think the students from the Philadelphia School District and beyond will greatly benefit from working with startups that aren't just tech-based or computer-based or app-based. They're things that you can get dirty, get your hands dirty, and actually work on developing a business from the ground up. On a related note, we need to make sure that we're not just growing and selling to high-end restaurants and high-end clients and high-end institutions. We need to make sure that this indoor local food movement is going to impact all residents of Philadelphia equally and that there's enough support uh, from City Hall for the nutrition-centric and food access social organizations that are going to be doing the great work and continue to do great work, things like the Food Trust. It's one thing to grow food, but it's an entirely new thing um, to distribute that equally. In addition to my previous question and suggestions, I recommend that the city create some sort of liaison that can help identify neighborhoods and properties, as, as you did mention earlier. Um, properties that the city can definitely identify and say, this is a good location for the production of, uh, of a farm, something that can, a place that can definitely benefit from a micro food economy, as well as help 
introduce us as entrepreneurs to the schools and universities that are interested in bringing the industry into the classroom. Networking events between restaurateurs, farmers, institutions, and locals are essential to the local VOR movement, and uh, Philadelphia should host as many as possible in less affluent areas. I'd also look towards creating a public-private partnership where we can incubate and accelerate the indoor farming business. Already we see an example of this in Brooklyn. Uh, instead of having just three or four massive players in the, in the game, um, I would envision seeing indoor farming revolution that's centered around small businesses. <coughs> Numerous farms that are run by their own communities, run by their own entrepreneurs, because um, I think that's really going to be the true driver of this economy, when we can have local people hiring their neighbors and creating small micro-economies uh, throughout our community here in Philadelphia. Uh, I think the city has a lot to gain from indoor farming, and Homegrown Farms is excited to continue working with City Council as we advance the future of farming. Thank you, and uh, happy holidays. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next panelist, please begin. Don't be shy. <clears throat> Put a mic to you, and if you would please state your name and title for the record. Good afternoon to all. My name is Stephen Hughes, and I'm a professor of biology and the director of the Aquaculture Research and Education Laboratory at Cheney University. Um, in simplistic, you've got my words in front of you, but some I will repeat today. Uh, economic development and public health are intimately connected to self-reliant and environmentally sustainable local food systems. To ensure the success of community and regional sustainable food systems, three topics must be addressed. One, development, development of sustainable urban farming practices. Two, local product distribution. And three, water conservation and safety. Aquaponics and related pharma tech farming technology offer solutions to all these challenges while increasing access to safe, fresh, nutritious, and affordable foods using sustainable, eco-friendly growing methods. Aquaponics combines two well-established practices, aquaculture and hydroponics, to grow food in a closed-loop system that reduces the use of water resources without the need for chemical fertilizers. In a nutshell, Aquaponics is the practice of growing fish and plants together in a closed loop system where the waste products from the fish are utilized as fertilizer for the plants. Aquaponics is gaining considerable attention lately and is in a serious sustainable farming practice with the potential for solving many problems that we face in the future with respect to climate change, depleted soils, potable water short and portable water, sh water so shortages. Despite the high initial cost of implementing an aquaponics system, much of the equipment is easily available because it is used by the hydroponic systems and recirculating aquaculture systems and aquaponics is further preferred because the initial estimates indicate that the operational costs are lower for either, than for either system operating in isolation. The aquaponic production of several crops, lettuce, cucumbers, tomatoes, basil, okra, microgreens, etc., has already been successfully demonstrated. Um, realistically speaking, from my aspect of looking at things, there are three areas that we need to really look at if we're going to have this industry grow and be well, if you'll pardon the pun, rooted here in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, first of all, research and extension. Anyone who's familiar with the farm industry realizes that once upon a time people were out there by themselves, they were doing what they did, but how do we really grow? the United States into being a, a tremendous agricultural industry. It was through the fact that we started to centralize research and extension opportunities and we provided that information directly to the farmers so that they could then apply that information and use it to increase profitability. This is some of the stuff that Jack Griffin was just really spent a great deal of time talking about. Um, and the sustainability is really a, a major issue nowadays. That's a key word that people throw around, but it is a reality. We need to worry about the resources that we have, that they're utilized efficiently, and that they are recir recycled as much as possible before they are discarded. Um, when we look at the scale of things, sometimes we do have to realize that things do not scale automatically. Um, Jack Griffin has done a great deal of research on his system so that scalability is there. There are a number of other systems out there that serve a purpose, um, and, but some, for some of them they have not been researched as well, and so things like that need to be done. A uh, perfect example, we have a collaborative on our campus with a group that's called Urban Farms that has been there for 10 years growing basil products, and the, their scalability has been well-founded with the way we work with them. Um, 
the second area that we need to really work on, um, my predecessor just mentioned in real good detail, education. Um, not only is, is the education to the farmers themselves, but also to incorporate this into the schools. Aquaponics, aqu hydroponics, aquaculture, all are extremely pliable platforms for which we can use on education. They are excellent for teaching across the curriculum because by bringing in one simple system into a classroom or into a school, you now have a way of teaching biology, chemistry, um, ecology. You can also teach business, marketing, uh, public relations, and, as, and, and, and sociology, all from this one platform. So involving that into our school systems and making it an active part of our K-12 education is a tremendous opportunity that we need to grab onto and accelerate, as well as putting it into, as well as taking advantage of the minds that we may have developed into our universities. Um, lastly, the commercial development, which is why we're all here today. There are a number of things. I'm not going to repeat all the wonderful things that Jack Griffin has already highlighted, because that would be a waste of your time. But certain other things are, are out there that are necessary for our farms to continue to be at the forefront of the industry and to be able to move forward and to have our products accepted in the, in the, um, in the, in the economic fields. Uh, number one, gap certifications, good agricultural practices. These things are not completely recognized by some of the USDA offices as of yet. We're in the process of <coughs> educating you them Could you them repeat on this. that? Are not? They are. Good agricultural practices are recognized and are put forward by the Agricult Department of Agriculture. But with regard to hydroponics and aquaponics, they're a little bit off. They haven't had a chance. Once again, we go back to the point that was made when you were speaking with Mr. Griffin. We're at a new edge in this industry. They're trying to apply old, old um, axioms to new systems, and they're not all fitting. That's why I mentioned before, we need you. I mean, we don't Yours. know the questions more or less the answers. Absolutely. So doing that and, you know, and, and taking advantage of things, we brought up the thing about Philadelphia um, and saying that something was grown locally in Philadelphia. We already have a broad-based... Um, platform to work off with Pennsylvania Preferred. So, like for example, the group that works with us and Urban Farms, their product is certified as Pennsylvania Preferred, and you see that on all their products, on all their, on all their trucks, etc. So, therefore, it gives that warm, fuzzy feeling for the consumer that this is a local product and it's not something that came from some faraway place with people that you don't know and that you can't associate with. Um, in addition. Regardless of how well we, or we design systems, regardless of how well we do things, we do still need disease assessment and treatment protocols and facilities where these things can be handled. Um, currently, they are, they are That's scary. very few and far between if they exist at all. So the development of these things within our, within our region will be critical to us growing this industry in a very rapid and very strong place. Um, once again, um, health certifications for the products. Um, one of the things that we worked with with Urban Farms extensively was that as part of their GAP certification, they had to come in with a, with a microbiological profile that said, you do not have E. coli, you do not have listeria, et cetera, within their systems. Where are we sending these samples to be certified? Once again, this is an infrastructure that if we put that in place here in Philadelphia, it continues to, to um, solidify us as a center for the growth of this industry. Um, also, the recognition of the fact that though we've talked a lot about abandoned buildings, there are a number of places where the building is either no longer there or the building has been <coughs> repurposed, but the grounds have been contaminated. The way that most of these things are being done, these are types of operations that can be run on brownfields without having to do a great deal of work to the brownfields to try and completely mitigate the brownfield certification. So once again, this is another way of getting food out of places that you couldn't build a playground on. 
but you can grow food there. Um, another, and lastly, the one other thing that we always have to keep an eye on and we have to watch is regardless of what we say, regardless of what we do, um, there's another layer above us. There's a federal regulate, set of federal regulations that are coming. Um, USDA and FDA have become very wary of the fact that hydroponics and aquaponics have been out here for an extended period of time, but they're not truly regulated. So they are beginning to look at the possibility as soon as they finish with, this, with the sprout industry, there's going to be a very concerted effort on um, putting a lot of emphasis on what does FDA want to do to the aquaponics and hydroponics industries. So we need to be there. We need to be ahead of it. We need to involve our university systems, our mines, our commercial people on all levels so that we're doing this in such a way that we can push this whole thing forward and that we can pre-anticipate some of the things that are going to be issues as we go along. Um, I'll put it out there on a, on a nice thing. Jack has a tremendous thing. We at Cheney would be more than happy to continue to collaborate with him well, we, and we've with already, anyone else. We've already planned our road trip to come see well, you. Well, I'm glad you, uh, and you will be welcome when you come. We, we've, um, been there, we've been there for a while, we're, and let's put it this way. Our, back to the pun, Cheney's roots are here in Pennsylvania. And so they're I here know in Philadelphia. we have at least one alumni so we're going excited to, about going up. Oh, yes. Congresswoman, I mean, Councilwoman Blackwell has already been out there. She's seen our operation. And so has Tottenberger. So, we're going to um, rest. Yeah, we, we were all coming. Well, so, we'd, be, we'd be more than pleased to have you. So the first time I heard about fish farms and uh, this was at Cheney University. I've never been there, but I knew you existed. And now, you know, it's come full circle and we're coming up. Well, we, we love the advantage of taking what has already been established with hydroponics and adding to it a second crop. Um, in that now you not only can grow um, your plant products, but you also get a high protein product in terms of fish. But and that fish product can be virtually anything that we want it to be. We just have to figure out a way to pair it with the appropriate plant base. But when you think about the education opportunities, so they may start with Jack, ex-offender, this, that, or the other, that wants to be certified as X, Y, or Z, kosher, or whatever, they go to an institution like Cheney and get their official credentials. The other thing is, the first time I heard an, an agronomist, I heard from a gentleman in this room, I think he's still here, uh, my, my daughter was on her way to medical school. And then she heard about the wonderful holistic properties of a plant, and she changed careers. Now, I'm, I'm happy that she's happy, but the, the gifts for Father's Day are definitely different <laughs> when you're a surgeon versus a farmer thus far. So we want you to do well so I can get better gifts. Um, <laughs> Councilwoman, or Councilman Green, you want to? Yes. Sir. Now go to Blackwell. Just very quickly, um, I'm saying as a bad for my colleague, the Vice Chair's Committee, um, Councilman Parker. She made a statement before she left that although she is a graduate of Lincoln University, she's here to collaborate with you at Cheney and also both Booker T. Washington and um, George Washington Carver. We're very happy to hear your commentary and the, the work you're doing at Cheney. Councilwoman. Thank you. We, um, maybe you remember an aquaponics operation. The urban food on lab. Yes, that's right. And it was wonderful. I'll tell you, it's been a few years, and uh, we had students in the community involved right on 60th Street, close to your district, Councilman. We had, um, we had this aquaponics location where, and they were selling to stores in the neighborhood. They had a partnership with uh, wow. Cheney, and uh, it was just wonderful. And we were hoping, uh, I guess money-wise, somehow they couldn't, maintain themselves at that location, but it was a wonderful, wonderful program. Do you um, have uh, uh, a criteria about maybe CTE program training in the school district and what we can do That's to support program. something like this? Because it would be wonderful and something we would love to formally support and ask them to do. If you're looking at the school systems, there are 
We can go in either one of two directions. There are already existing curricula that could be adapted to what um, we want to accomplish here in Philadelphia. Um, I would say if we're going to go more in the direction of the vertical farming um, and uh, really going after that aggressively, I think we can retool that, that curricula in such a way that it gives these students a wonderful opportunity to look at experiences that they've never, they've never thought about. Um, let me take a real half step backwards for a moment, just to give you an idea of where this can take somebody. Um, I'm a PhD university professor, did 24 years in the federal government as a research scientist. Um, I've been doing this for 37 years. Where did it all start? It all started with an aquarium in my mother's basement. Okay, that, so it doesn't take much to send a child in a different direction. And it was one of the nicest things that my mother had. She never had to worry about where I was because she walked in the house. I was a latchkey kid. And she could walk in the house. She walked to the basement door. She opened the basement door. Steve, you down there? Yep, I'm down here. What are you doing? Playing with the tanks. Okay, close the door. She knew where I was every day. Why? Because I, because I found something that excited me. Um, did not realize that was going to be a career at the time. That didn't come until graduate school. But the thing is this. We have a number of children out here who have tremendous minds and tremendous interests and tremendous capability to be the leaders of this planet. But they just don't know what they want to do. Um, my running argument out at the university is I, my, I keep trying to get our biology students to stop wanting to be doctors, doctors, dentists, and, and nurses. Because that seems to be all they come in with the idea being. This is a way of treating your society well, of uplifting your society, and also putting food and jobs on the table every day. So let's look at it. Let's look at it hard. Let's encourage people like we have sitting here now to continue to develop. And let's encourage our, our schools all the way from K to K all the way through graduate school to embrace this as a way of looking at a way uh, as a part of our, our region. Well, we would like to, this committee and our chair and certainly the education committee that I chair, we would like to work with you to try to push that agenda forward so that it can, it can help so many uh, youngsters who would be as excited as you were growing up. And so, I'm sure that the chairman agrees. Yeah, I definitely. I think it's an excellent idea. The two biggest things I see that I'm excited, I, I'm grossly excited about, are the opportunity to work on the educational side of aquaponics, hydroponics, et cetera, and secondarily to provide some of what I, what I spoke about earlier in terms of the extension needs of this yep. industry. Because right now, we've sort of been ignored. Um, you know, the people who run Cooperative Extension don't view this as a big deal right now. I think we can grab onto this and I think we can make it something really significant. And so providing those chemical analyses, those disease analyses, whatever it is, um, we'd love to be a part of all that comes into doing that and doing the demonstration facilities, et cetera, and helping this industry grow rapidly and strong. Councilman Tullenberger told me you're an ethiologist, but now I know it started in your basement and led you to this. So if, if, is it possible to grow your own food at home in an aquarium? Is Not it an possible? aquarium, but you, well, Bigger than aquarium. the Bigger? whole thing that this started off with, a lot of this started off with, there used to be a group called Rodale um, here in Pennsylvania, and they used to do a lot of things where they started things with aquaponics, where they were using the fish and growing fish and plants. And, and keep in mind, this whole concept is 5,000 years old. It was started with the Chinese. It was start, there, are, there are pictures in the pyramids of Egyptians doing aquaponics and aquaculture. So as, as was said in one of Solomon's books, there's nothing new under the sun. We're just trying to tweak it a little bit. So what are the top fish that you're producing? Because I know about the basil and strawberries on the vegetable side. At our facility, we're yeah. predominantly working koi and tilapia. Um, could very easily be branched out into catfish. It could be branched out into trout. It could be branched out into striped bass, largemouth bass. Um, it's 
one of those things where we can do a lot of different things and it really is just a matter of matching um, in terms of matching plants and fish together in a system to make it all worthwhile. Councilman. Dr. Hughes, thank you very, very much for your time coming down, also your expertise and of course the, the entire panel, uh, but also for taking the time to uh, have me and uh, my staff tour your facility and uh, we look forward to coming again and uh, we, we have a lot of things we, we, we need to work on. The, the extension efforts and just, uh, this is my theory coming out of Penn State, which is the extension school for the, <laughs> for the state of Pennsylvania. I was trying to be nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our football team did pretty well. But one of the things we're, we're doing in this situation we need to really, and this is where I am so delighted to have the cooperation of the, my colleagues in council, and particularly the chair of this committee, is that we need to tell the story because in Pennsylvania we're a big agricultural state and we are competing against traditional agriculture in, in, in different ways for their attention and their money. And, and like I said earlier, Pennsylvania is the, fifth, the fourth largest dairy state in the nation. That's a good thing, but also when, it, when, it, when you look at Penn State agriculture, that's where the focus is because that's where the money is right now. On the other hand, if they can see the value of this, and I've been in, cooper, uh, in, in, in dialogue with Penn State Extension folks. We, in fact, had some of them out to uh, see Jack's farm, but we need to t do more of that. We need to really, really hone down and tell that story mm -hmm. because there is a definite need for not only the food and the protein, the source, uh, but also the jobs and the opportunity. When you're the poorest, largest city in the world, you better start doing things a little differently, and we're prepared to do it. And this is just one of the things we can do, but it's a great tool. What I particularly like about your program, Doctor, is it, it does involve fish, and that's another source of protein. Uh, tilapia is a, is a very, very popular fish today, and actually it's a historic fish in the fact that it was caught in the Sea of Galilee, and they, they call it St. Peter's fish in, in, in the Bible. So it, it's, it's well, well known. Uh, we just have to tell the story of how, how good this can all be for, one, our economy, two, also for your health, and three, freshness, you know, close to market, being close to the source, which Jack alluded to in his testimony. This is very, 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 very important, important things. What I did want to ask you, though, you did brought up, brought up something, well, the, the preferred Pennsylvania, who, who regulates that? Who is the... the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Okay, okay. That's, that's good to know. They, they also are aware of what we're doing, so that's also a, a very, very, very good step. And, and the second, you had said there are federal regulations that are sort of like in the billhopper or being talked about in regards to, I guess, hydroponics and aquaponics. Right. What, what more do you know of this? I mean, where... Um, there are going to be regulations that are going to be put out basically saying, you know, a, a very quick and very short history. If you sit and you think back on the news flashes that have come out over time recently, um, there was a major outbreak where there were some sprouts that came out of Germany or something like that and people ate them, got sick and died. Um, things of this nature, it, it has greatly erased the awareness of the FDA and USDA of that we have organizations that, as Jack described, some of these are mom and pop organizations. Um, I'm growing, you know, bean sprouts in my basement and selling them. Well, fine, but how clean are they? What, right. what, you know, who's regulating what comes out? And they weren't. And so right now they're working very hard on that. But in the process of doing that, they looked at that system and said, wait a minute, these other things are also out there. So there's going to be things, you know, looking at the predominant bacterial and viral pathogens. Um, but by the same token, we're going to have to be able to prove that those things are controlled within our facilities. Gotcha. Jack's facility is an excellent example of one oh. where it is controlled very well. I, I was going to say that. But, in fact, uh, the, his workers actually all wear gloves. So right. I'm, I'm very, very impressed with that but operation. It's, you know, but others are different and others, you know, there's a bunch of things that are going. Um, you know, and there's going to be a bunch of arguments that have come with, well, look, yeah, you're making me do this, but this guy over here is selling stuff and he's using dairy ways to fertilize his fields. Yeah. Why doesn't he have to live to the same standard I do? Right. It will be a very unique set of questions that come out of this. But by the same token, they're coming. 
And so we need to be aware of them. Um, another thing that will probably be a perfect example, if you go to a number of facilities around, um, including the one at Janey, um, a number of people are using, have used wood framing for what they do on their, um, when they build their beds. Um, that can foster mold. Right. That's going to be a no-no. Um, right. So they're going to look for types of material that can be scrubbed down, you know, et cetera. Or if you're going to use wood, it's going to have to be completely encased in something so no moisture is getting to it, and no, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot of different things that are going to go all the way from simply defining what the food, what the safety levels are for the food. And that's another unique thing because a lot of that research hasn't been done. Um, all the way to how is a how is a how is a facility going to have to be structured, and how are things going to do? And trust me, it's going to shut down a lot of people, unfortunately. Un un and that's the, unfortunate. The other but. part of your testimony that I that I really liked quite a bit was, uh, and 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 they got the Councilwoman Blackwell very very interested, and I think it makes sense is is being having this curricula as part of certain public schools wherever they can accept it and do it. Uh, I, I think teaching young people, I think so much can be taught, as you elaborated so very, very well, from agriculture. You have math skills, science skills, um, marketing skills, uh, health skills. It's, it's, you said it very, very eloquently. It's, it is a big deal. Um, we've worked over past years, not currently, we've worked with Saul. We're working with Sayre High School. We've talked with a couple of other high schools in Philadelphia about working with them. Um, so we're excited about the opportunities to be there and to do that with these Actually, groups, these Lincoln groups. High School in Northeast Philadelphia has a small agricultural program. And, yep, so we'd like well, to work with them. We're working with some of the ones out in Chester County where we're located also. Sure. So we're excited about those possibilities and of, of doing other things that make training programs that make um, this whole industry a little bit more accessible. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Councilman. It, it brings up the life of a diff, uh, district council person is interesting, to say the least. I literally <clears throat> got a complaint from a constituent that was a restaurateur, had been a manager in a number of places, and God, I hope he's not watching. Um, and he wanted to patent or, or produce his own wine. And he had a distillery kind of fermentation process in his basement, next door to occupied houses. And so he said, I know what I'm doing and stay, that it, come see it, councilman. I, I go, I accommodate him. We go down the basement and it, I didn't know what I was looking at, but I know what I didn't want to see. What I didn't want to see was the kitty litter right next to the oh, fermentation thing. And, and I didn't say anything to him, I, I just, we denied him, uh, but, but sometimes, we, you know, we, that's why I beseech you guys to tell us what we need to know. On, we don't want to over-regulate anything. We'll tax everything. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we don't want to over-regulate it. Um, and so tell us what we self-regulate almost. Write your own regs. As to, and not, not so that the micro-farmer can get in it, because I know that's not your intentions, but if you tell me I have to have this, that, and the other, and it's prohibitive, we need to be a little kind of balanced in that, and we can't wait to be able to say, here's how you get started. Here's how you grow a vegetable. So wh what we're gonna do is we're gonna let our last patient person um, to testify, hearing all of this stuff, so. I am following some, um, some hard acts. So um, good afternoon. Thank you all for having me today Maya, and allowing me to speak more of the future of farming in Philadelphia. My name is Amy Black and I'm here in support of Metropolis Farms. I also work at Greensgrow. Mm -hmm. I am speaking independently. Um, they know I'm here and support me. Um, I met Jack Griffin in June of 2006 as I was still getting my bearings in the Philadelphia food scene. I was immediately impressed and inspired by his passion for a just and sustainable food system and the enormous vision he saw for Philadelphia. I saw an opportunity for Philadelphians, for farmers, for consumers, all through the creation of a resilient vertical farming industry. It wasn't just improving efficiencies of modern day farming, it was, it's the social potential. It is the opportunity to provide farmers resources to provide and produce food year round and therefore a more consistent and reliable income. It's the creation of green collar jobs that will provide Philadelphians a living wage and meaningful work. 
It is ensuring that Philadelphia has a secure and safe stream of food throughout the year without concern of external forces that could aff affect food access. Policies requiring local food procurement and support of vertical and urban, urban farms will facilitate these positive social and economic benefits. Um, what gives me the merit to talk of this? So I've dedicated most of my professional career to sustainable agriculture. I spent three years in Paraguay. I went to Penn State as well. Um, and I worked as a Peace Corps volunteer working with families and co-ops to establish gardens, improve economic independence, and shared information on sustainable agricultural practice, beekeeping, and nutrition, and educating the youth about farming, food, and nutrition. I watched mothers feed their families from their gardens and children express interest in farming, a career path that has a social stigma both here and there. As I pursued my master's degree in food studies at New York University, I worked as the director of sustainability at the largest catering company where we connected our farm upstate to restaurants and consumers as well as advocating for a sustainable food system. I worked on connecting surplus food to food banks. Ideally, this will admit having urban farms will really allow for those to be connected even better um, and devise strategies to minimize food waste. Now, as I mentioned, I have the privilege at working at Greens Grove Farm where I help run the, city, the CSA, which is known as the City of Supported Agriculture, and a retail operation. I work with small-scale farmers and artisan food makers to provide produce, meat, and dairy products for our CSA members and the general public. As you all probably know, Greens Grove is an institution it's been around for over 20, we're actually celebrating our 20th anniversary of operation this year. Um, and there's over 40 full-time and part-time staff, although they are seasonal, which is why I see enormous benefits of having vertical farming supported here. Um, its mission is to drive economic and community development, support urban and local farmers, and improve access of affordability of fresh food to all Philadelphians, and really just generally make the world a better place. Um, again, as I mentioned, I am speaking independently, but with the support. Um, so with my experiences, there have been several themes in the food system, specifically um, involving come, these, um, there's been seven, pardon me, there have been several themes in the food system, specifically limited infrastructure and resources for farmers, the high capital costs farmers need to invest to stay afloat, the unreliable demand for farmers' products, seasonal jobs that do not often provide a living wage, food safety, food access, and serious environmental dam damage caused by unsustainable farming methods. I see the council having an opportunity to fix that. The 2008, conference, the, the 2008 U.S. Conference of the Mayors indicated overwhelming support for the creation of green collar jobs in cities to encourage economic growth and environmental conservation. I see the potential for Philadelphia to be the hub and innovation center of it, vertical farming. With that comes an array of advantages, one being the creation of green collar jobs. As our local food shed and respective farmers increase in, receive increased and consistent demand from institutional purchases, they should be able to invest in new processes and systems, supporting hydroponics, vertical farming, and an array of other systems. This could likely entail an interest in growing year-round and seeking technology and partners that facilitate this increased demand in urban and peri-urban areas. It will encourage younger portions of the population to pursue farming as a viable profession, this is especially important as the U.S. Census Bureau found that the average age of farmers has increased over eight years, over the past 30 years. So most farmers, farmers went from 50 years old to 58 years old. So our farming population is aging. Many of my friends from graduate school have tried to start small-scale urban farms, and they found it's almost impossible to tap into a larger market because of the limited resources that they have um, and not having to work at multiple jobs to actually support themselves and their passion, which is providing people with food. This is also common for most conventional farms outside of urban areas where they have to hold multiple jobs to allow them to continue farming. This is because of the limited time span that you have for farming in agriculture. So increased demand for local food and this option and privilege of maybe of growing year round will encourage this full-time employment system. It will allow those dedicated to providing us fresh food with financial incentives to remain in the industry. It will drive individuals to participate in this industry and ideally revitalize it once again. Um, in my opinion, Metropolis Farms is offering a system that will provide economic viability, research and development for growing practices and seed banks, and serve as a resource for farmers, to farmers. Farmers will be able to augment their current system with year-round methods that will provide Philadelphians with a safe and secure stream of food, utilizing technology that is affordable and adaptable, as he mentioned. In terms, they will be able to hire and retain green-collar employees year-round, eliminating the seasonal, seasonal employment trend that plagues farms throughout the nation. 
Those economic effects will be great, creating a new industry and tax revenue stream that could further community infrastructure and our own resources in Philadelphia. To me, I see institutional local food procurement safe, um, kind of instituted by city council um, as a safeguard for food access and food security and food sovereignty for Philadelphia. Geopolitics, environmental changes, and trade regulations could impact the current food systems model of procuring food nationally and internationally. The systems divide by metro metropolis farms and other vertical and urban farms in the area have controlled growing environments that mitigate external factors, such as droughts, blights, and storms, along with a host of other issues. And they provide a secure and steady stream of food for our city. As Jack and many other mentioned, we eat an insane amount of food in Philadelphia, but we produce next to nothing. So this is something I think is valuable. Um, temp temperature, water, and light are controlled through efficient systems that maximize resources and minimize loss, as well as eliminate the need of petrochemicals and manure. This, in turn, reduces the risk of foodborne illnesses. Controlling external factors reduces these, this food insecurity and will make Philadelphia have control over its own food sovereignty, which means its own production and, therefore, control over all the food that comes in and out. To me, um, the requirement of local food procurement and emphasis on building infrastructure for vertical farmers and hydroponics and every, everyone else um, also supports economic growth by supporting these local farms, that the money spent on food as paid to, and paid to the providers purveyor stays within our community and leads to improvements in Philadelphia's economy. On the community side, community members will actually know where their food comes from. It will connect people to farmers and hopefully increase awareness on food and nutrition. We all know food access is an issue in Philadelphia. Ensuring that SNAP programs and mobile markets receive fresh and local food and supporting agencies to participate in procuring more local food um, will further bolster food security and food access for these, these needed communities. Um, ultimately creating a community with, with food grown for our people by our people. Environmentally, by growing in Philadelphia, we eliminate the environmental effects associated with food miles. As Jack mentioned, he doesn't have to travel very far, or any of us have to travel very far to deliver food to our, to our members, to our constituents. Food will be produced in the city, minimizing the miles and greenhouse gases, gases associated with long distances. This also means that produce arrives fresher with the possibility that it is harvested and sold on the same day. Um, eliminating the need of chemicals not only helps the planet, but it saves farmers an enormous amount of money and protects consumers from potential carcinogenic, carcinogenic concerns of petrochemical use. In Paraguay, I saw firsthand how unsustainable growing practices by large-scale producers directly affected small-scale subsistence farmers. They faced contamination of crops, contaminated water supplies, and, the market, and a market that favored irresponsible growing practice as opposed to ones that were stewards of the land and their communities. I saw water tables drop because industrial farmers were tapping into aquifers that supplied water to communities. Utilizing technologies such as the ones that we have available now could really minimize this, not just here, but nationally, internationally. At the same time, there's hope. I watched families work together to create gardens that would provide them consistent access to food that would be safe and ultimately free, utilizing some of the most basic forms of hydroponics, but they tried, um, using the limited resources that we had. In that sense, they began to create their own secure food shed, granted on a small scale compared to Philadelphia, and this eliminated some food insecurity. Um, in my opinion, Philadelphia has led the way in considering food systems as part of its larger policy and infrastructure. The city has led, um, the city has one of the, the city has, pardon me, this is one of the few metropolitan areas that actually has a food system plan in place that was started by the Delaware um, Valley Regional Planning Commission. Um, and also has an active food policy advisory council. We are the first city to enact a soda tax, and there are a multitude of organizations working towards eliminating poverty, hunger, and ultimately diet-related illnesses, requiring a local food procurement and supporting vertical farmers and urban farmers is an opportunity that would change the economy of Philadelphia and jumpstart an industry that could produce green-collar jobs, feed our city, and be at the forefront of environmental conservation. Everyone eats. It's why I chose this career path. I have the greatest impact to work towards a food where everyone has accessible, affordable, and safe food. I share this vision with Metropolis Farms and believe that the opportunities that will develop through this requirement of supporting vertical farming and this industry um, by institutions, by the support of um, the council, and by the mayor's office could really affect how Philadelphia operates in the future. Thank you for your time. You know, as I listen to you guys, Dr. 
your teacher by profession, or professor, I'm sorry, by profession. It, imagine a world where the students listen to the professors and then the students give the professor a grade. Well, that's kind of how we feel up here because we're going back and forth on all of the things we learned uh, from you guys. And one question that comes to mind is that the food distribution plan, you used the acronym for it? The Delaware Valley, well, it's not the food, it's the food systems plan for Philadelphia and the Philadelphia metro area. It's the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. They did it in 2010. I'm familiar with that. Oh, yeah. But what is the plan that they have? They had, so it was more a series of recommendations, and everything that is actually being spoken here today is, is touched on. Um, their plan is pretty much a, it's a series of recommendations that would encourage vertical and urban farming revitalization, so jobs, job well, creation. Could you forward, or um, Ms. Williams, can you make sure, if there's a plan in place, oh, yeah. we don't need to, to reinvent you. the wheel, mm -hmm. we need to take a look at the plan yeah. so that we, we, we actually listen to you up here. We may look like we're not, but we actually do. No, it has some great guidelines, and it, what everyone is speaking on on this panel, it, it supports pretty much everything that it's saying and really gives some clear objectives and strategies for governments to move forward, um, and I, I think it's a useful tool. We use it in grad school as like a way, and this was actually what I did a research project on was Philadelphia. Second thing, and that's for the entire panel. So I was having dinner with my grandkids <laughs> and I asked them where food comes from. Oh yes. And you know what they said? Oh, uh, the grocery, the grocery store? store. Yeah. Well, silly grandpa, right? So this is an important step for me. So I'm gonna ask the silly question again. Where do seeds come from? Where do you get seeds. your seeds? Well, I think everyone probably procures it differently. I know Greensboro will do some seed saving, so you can harvest seeds from plants and dry them, put them in a secure storage area, and then reuse them for the following year. You can also do, anyone can do that. Um, you can also use Johnny Seeds. There's an array of organic seeds providers that have awesome seed catalogs that come in the mail in the springtime. So or you guys fall. actually have seed catalogs? Do you get excited when you see yes. your seed yes. catalog? Yes. <laughs> Can I just, can I interject for a second? Yeah. Seeds are incredibly, Hold the mic to you. Seeds are incredibly important, and it's going to be a shortage in the future. Um, we're getting into a point where we're doing what's called monocultures. I'm sure you will all chime in on this. Um, let me put it this way. Once upon a time, there was this potato. It was called the lumper. That potato was responsible for killing a million Irishmen because all they grew was that one potato. So that potato couldn't respond to a disease. They didn't have any biodiversity. One of the risks we have in commercial farming today, one of the risks that we foresee, I went and saw a movie earlier this week. If you get an opportunity to see Seed, it's a great movie. Um, it was about how we exist right now. Most people off of 10 Well, disease comes around, like SARS came around. Remember SARS? Wasn't here, then it was here. What happens if that happens and wipes out three of those seeds? If we don't have the biodiversity, if we don't have those additional seeds out there being grown, constantly being put in seed banks, that will be the end of tens of millions of people. We will starve. So seed banks, creating biodiversity with these. One of the things that I think we're probably all working on independently, I'm working on a system right now to propagate seeds for seed banks as because I feel that I'm adding to the problem because we operate in monocultures. So I think that we have a responsibility as responsible business people to fix these problems. So we're working on that. We've been talking about that for a while. We've been Easy. talking about that for a while. But we need to work on those things because those are our future plagues. And if you really look at the, uh, I mean, the way industrial, commercial agriculture is right now, I mean, there's very few. Monsanto being the yeah, biggest yeah, player yeah. of seeds, and they have seeds that will come out with fruit and come out with crops that actually won't reproduce. So for us as a, a side industry or a sub-industry, is to be able to foster, mm -hmm. hey, this is a new community that can grow We're the seeds really or anything. develop the seeds for, for our industry that can actually responsibly right. grow the next generation of crops rather than just cutting it off at the, uh, at the stock, to say. So, so the seed question is an extension of this, and now I know there are seed catalog, category, uh, catalogs and seed stores that you guys get sure. excited about. That's good to know. Um, and, and, and so the GM... Oh, yeah. 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 So, so are they like the bad guys or? Well, I mean, let me describe a GMO for you. 
um, and, and it's probably is I'm not politically correct, so I'm, I'm trying. Um, so if an Asian American married uh, a Hispanic American, you would have a hybrid child. Now, if an Asian American married a coconut and they tried to have a baby, that would be a GMO. It's like taking a fish gene and putting it into a tomato to get a better tomato fights. It's, 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 in my opinion, they're, they're a disaster. Uh, you, you constantly hear about how they're good, but generally speaking, for example, Monsanto made GMOs. They're no longer with us, thank God. Uh, but they made GMOs so they could, they, they could use, they, they, they would handle the pesticides that they sold as a chemical company. Okay? And they took their seeds and they, they, they basically had their pollen spread into other fields and then said, you farmer over there, we have a patent on this and you have to burn your crops down or you owe us for this crop. It was a disastrous piece of law. It's a disastrous. One of the things that, that I like about our technology is because we can control things at the process level. I don't care about their seeds. I don't need them. Um, we grow with a roof. Try and get your pollen into my facility. Green. Um, additionally, the other thing that we, like perfect um, example, that we ran into um, back in, was it 10 or 7? I can't remember, 2010. Um, not only are we concerned about the seeds from the standpoint of that they grow well or that they have the genetic diversity, the seeds can also carry, carry pathogens and right. diseases. Mm -hmm. And perfect example, um, one that has become, that almost devastated a lot of industries here is a thing called downy mildew. Mm -hmm. And we watched it, it was mostly in Europe and everything else for a while. Somebody brought it over accidentally somehow. It was in the southern tip of Florida, like 2006. 2007, it covered most of Florida. And then we hit that one lousy hurricane year where we had like three or four or five hurricanes that went through all at one time. The next year, it was all the way up through Nebraska, up into Michigan, everything. The, the, the spores had just been carried up. The big thing that we also found out after that was that downy mildew also infested the seeds. And so, you know, like for example, the people that I'm working with went to extreme parts to try and find seed vendors that would give them downy mildew sort of free certified seeds so that they weren't bringing it right back into their facility again. So, the, you know, so it's not just what you're growing, it's what comes along for the ride that can also right. be a problem. So that's why, again, you have to tell us what we don't know. And, and so if somebody introduces this mutant strand of yeah. apple seed and it infects the, it's like right out of a sci-fi movie. Um, and, and so it, it's governments rely on experts to create standards, and that's what we're going to need. Bottom line, if you like sci-fi movies, study biology. <laughs> <laughs> we live it every day. Right. Um, Councilman Green and then Councilman Yeah, I'll, I'll just be very short. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for your um, creativity in what you're doing in the farming industry from to Akron Metropolis and the vertical farming. Um, I had a chance to meet uh, late founder of Greens Grow uh, some years ago when we were doing some opportunities at Logan Triangle, um, homegrown farms. Thank you for what you're doing. And Dr. Hughes, thank you for what you're doing in reference to Cheney University. And just listening to this information just makes you reflect on farming, what's happened to farming um, over the years. And, and I think, Jack, you were talking about um, pesticides. And I know from a lot of farmers that get caught in that um, uh, catch 22 that they can't afford to not use the pesticides but then they have to and then if they try to get out of it because of the financial constraints they just can't and that's why you have um, big ag and, and, and they, they have combined with the petrochemicals and other companies and it just creates a larger and larger um, monopoly uh, in reference to food. I think people think about like an AT&T um, Time Warner merger or HBO Time Warner merger or, or other type of large type of mergers but are not aware of what's already happening or hap and continue to happening in their food that they eat every day because they want to see that redder tomato or that redder apple and not knowing that the pesticides and GMOs are all the stuff that's being used to make that color which is not natural 
and then you get into situations of some of the challenges we have um, with some of the GMOs and some of the um, pathogens that are spread along over over time. And that's why it's important um, for this type of conversation to continue on uh, creativity so smaller farmers and other entrepreneurs can be able to provide um, produce for us to eat in a healthy way. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Skip Wiener, Skip uh, the Green Guard, Skip. Pardon? Gentleman named Skip Wiener in, um, in West Philly, um, in I think uh, Janie's district. It's right across the street from me. He used um, uh, rain barrels, a series of uh, uh, rainwater runoff trails to irrigate his particular piece with the PCP, PCB piping that you had. He would store it, right. wait until, and then re, reuse it. Is that, <clears throat> and downspout planters, things like that, are we using those things in a small way, not to be commercial farmers, but subsistence farmers that every now and then you can grow a batch of tomatoes? We, we, we should be, but you have to realize a couple things that people, it, it's kind of like what the doctor was saying. Um, you have folks that are growing in soil, they're not testing their soil. Their soil's got lead in it. Their soil's got mercury in it. They're not dealing with that. When water's coming from the rain, it's passing through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a filter. filter. Whatever's in the atmosphere is in that water. You've got to filter it. You've got to do the right thing. There needs to be education and there needs to be, I mean, there, there's, 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 there's folks like Cheney, there's folks like us that are doing this. Like the gentleman here, we're, we're doing this in such a way that it's very, very controlled. You know, uh, you're, 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 there are others that just think, well, I think I'll just go out and do this. And there needs to be some, some folks in government saying, you know what, you can do this, but here are the tests you need to run first. Does that sound about right? Yeah. But then also, Appreciate it. I think also Use the mic them. and say your name again every time. Oh, Amy Black. Um, but I think if you do that, and I think that's really important to standardize, you know, this kind of certification for urban vertical farming. But I think some of them are smaller, and you have to consider some of the financial constraints of testing. So providing resources or partnerships with universities for all, not just for the low, but like everyone should be able to have access to free testing of soil. Because if you're providing food, I mean, everyone wants to do it well and, and provide it with well, good intentions. But I do think making that connection with universities would be important. Thank you. I, I do have, uh, yes, one, one comment, uh, two comments. I, I, Comment and a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as it relates to, uh, in fact, you're, you're opening cobwebs of my mind that I haven't thought about in a while since I have a degree in agronomy. And, but when you talk about seed production, that is actually a unique situation in any industry. For example, the, the seed that we use on our home lawns in, in, in Pennsylvania comes out of two states, either Washington or Oregon, and that's all they do. They, they, don't, they don't grow sod, they don't grow anything else, they grow the seed for the sod or for, for home lawns. And getting back to Mr. what Mr. Griffin had said in being uh, teaching, Philadelphia has always been on the forefront. One of our companies developed in the city of Philadelphia is a world leader in seed production. Uh, they're no longer in the city, but they were, and they were founded here, and that's Burpee. Burpee Seeds came out of Philadelphia in the city itself. So we, we have the, uh, what would be the, best, the tradition of teaching and expanding out. So it is the right thing to do historically and scientifically to be on the cutting edge of uh, hydroponic farming. I do have a question for Mr. Chinon, and, and that is, we spoke last, and, and, and also congratulations that you were at ThinkFest. I thought your presentation was, was, was very, very good. Thank you. Um, I know most of your operation at date is, is actually in Pensacola, New Jersey. Correct. But you are developing a place in, in North Philadelphia, is that correct? Yes. Question, yes. how far along are you with that? We're currently still doing the design. We have all the specs. We're figuring out you know, which pieces we want to use, which types of technology we exactly think are appropriate, um, given the space constrictions and given what uh, produce you want to actually be growing. We're looking and seeing what's the demand, what kind of crops do we want to grow before we develop that final system. And, and two, why did you choose Philadelphia? I mean, out of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, you could have gone anywhere. You could have went to New York City or anywhere. Well, I, I grew up here. Uh, for me, it's, it's always been about, you know, helping out a local economy and helping out people that I can call Great. my neighbors rather than someone, you know, out in an exotic city like New York that might not uh, benefit as greatly as, as our community can. 
And, and please stay in touch with the committee as far as if you're having any obstacles with city government yeah. that are impeding your progress on opening this, this farm. Appreciate thank that. you. Th thank you for your time in, in coming, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? No second generation farmers on this entire panel is. That's amazing. You second generation? Yes, but my grandfather was also a doctor. So was your mother and fa or father? Oh, a f oh, no, my father is an, kind of. He did it briefly and then had to give it up because you don't make money. I'll give you a, a partial. I get a half. But pretty much you guys are <laughs> kind of cutting edge on a new career for your generation, which I'm impressed. I was consulting until two months ago. So you yes, quite a, I was in consulting two months ago. So quite a, quite a different shift. Very much a career change. Similar to my daughter. No. I don't know if your dad will approve. Thank you guys for your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, the clerk, uh, Ms. Williams, would you please read, uh, hopefully, the final to testify? Final panel of witnesses will be David Griffith and Claire Calloway. Ms. Zachary, are you testifying? Well, let's go. And actually, Mr. Addition, Chairman, Carol as, Zachary. As, 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 if I could just have a word as the right. panel gets ready, and that is uh, I've been advised uh, by, uh, by Jack that everyone is invited, everyone, all participants are invited to a reception at the Barrel Restaurant located at 19th Street just south of Rittenhouse Square uh, from now, 3.30 to 5.30, to partake in some food that was actually grown at the uh, farm. And that's uh, 267 South 19th Street. And as I also know, this is supposed to be a really up and coming uh, restaurant in the Philadelphia Barrel Restaurant. Okay, thank you for that invitation on locally sourced foods. Um, thank you. Would you state your name for the record? And thank you for your patience. Yes. Uh, sir. And please um, begin your testimony. Uh, I assume we can hear. My name is David Griffith. I'm the I'm here in several capacities. I'm the current executive director of Episcopal Community Services. Been working with Jack and the team for some time. I'm also the chairman of Delaware Valley Floral Group, the nation's largest wholesale florist and grower in this space. Uh, I'm also the chairman of Modern Group Limited, which is a supplier of supply chain materials to Jack. Uh, and I also happen to be a trustee of the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia. So my interest in this space is extensive, um, and I'm really here to share our experience in the research and the economics, um, but particularly my interest is my current work at Episcopal Community Services. Uh, we are focused on economic mobility. Um, we run uh, housing, workforce development, educational enrichment. We're the third largest out of school time program in the city, uh, wellness programs, financial assistance, and community development. Our interest with Jack is uh, on the issue of economic mobility and job creation, on wellness, and on community development. ECS is 146 years old. Uh, it is one of the oldest social service agencies in the city. Um, some of you will know St. Barnabas's mission for women and children out at 60th and Girard. Uh, we're also in nine schools around the city. Um, our focus is on the most vulnerable. And our issue very simply is that the way out of poverty is a job. Uh, and we have a criteria of 18 bucks an hour and benefits would break the cycle. Um, the economics of the work we've done with Jack clearly creates those jobs. Um, and there's some interesting attributes as a business person that I'll share with you about Jack's model. Um, but it's a unique opportunity for public and private and nonprofit partnerships to do something that could really be a major game changer uh, in the city. The, the issue, uh, quite simply, is we have an ambition to build an urban farm, vertical farm, uh, in every one of the communities we serve. Uh, it'll generate anywhere from 18 to 20 jobs, but more importantly, it stands on its own economically. 
So the ability to sustain itself and funding, there's a phenomenon in nonprofits called B Corps, where you're allowed to create a for-profit entity, which you can then use if 100% of the proceeds go, you can use it for mission. Uh, the vertical farming model uh, is one that lends itself to that model in an extensive way. So job creation, wellness because it would stay within the city. Um, there's some statistics about farm to table in the city that make it very interesting as well as just the urban uh, phenomenon of the universities and the hospital and city governments as, as customers. But there's an extraordinary opportunity to play into that from the economics. Um, we're also interested in, and I'm sorry the Council Blackwell, uh, Councilwoman Blackwell is no longer here, but um, we run 700 youth through STEM and STEAM education and the curriculum to integrate with these kinds of projects uh, we know is extraordinary. So that certainly is there as well. But let me speak to the economics because the industry, uh, we've been, I as an investor prior to joining ECS three years ago, uh, this was a space that I did extensive research on. Um, we developed relationships with both an Israeli firm and a French firm, uh, and then we were introduced to Jack and his business through Brian Murray at Shift Capital, who you may know as the developer up in Kensington and the redevelopment process up there. Uh, fact is, his statements are absolutely true. It is a 20 to 1 capital difference. Uh, which is extraordinary. So rather than 36 million to do it for 2 million to build a 60,000 square foot farm uh, is an extraordinary statement. There is room to improve on that. So it got our attention uh, in that respect. The market will bear, you asked a question about lettuce and where you would price it, you have room to be competitive. There is significantly more margin in his product than there is in anything else. Now. You can run at market and then use that margin for community development and job creation. But my message to you all is that if you can facilitate two things, one is the outtake agreement, which is the market for the products that are produced, which is work that you have well underway, that is a significant leg up to start this work. The second issue, and those of us who have worked in the city for a period of time, is the regulation and the permitting and the L&I and all that world that gets, it's necessary to be safe. Uh, and the regulatory on the, uh, on the E. coli in that world, that technology is, is being developed. If this is to become successful and we're to move quick and create jobs quick, it would be great if a task force could be put together to fast path these permits because I know it's taken me a year and a half to put a modular office in at St. Barnabas to expand it and I didn't escalate the system as I might have but I'm sure you have constituents who ask for help all the time. You should have called your councilman at 60th and July. And that's how the... He and, would have taken care and, of it. And that's how it finally got installed, sir. So, uh, well, well, uh, well said. But the job creation, the economic development, uh, we believe this thing can throw off margins in the 14 to 21 percent unleveraged return. That's extraordinary. If we can then turn that back into other projects, we have a number of social service agencies that are on the edge. Uh, Lutheran Family Services, you know, recently closed. We happened to pick up some of their out-of-school time programs. They were highly dependent on government contracts, both at the state and the federal level. We happen to be a much more diversified revenue stream. These farms, as a tool of community development, when partnered with a nonprofit that can deliver other services, educational opportunities with out-of-school time, you create an environment that is very, very unique. Now, set aside and look at Jack's manufacturing and software and intellectual property proposal. There are jobs, we're working with them right now to identify locations. We'll probably use an abandoned church would be the first, first location, working with the diocese. But the issue is there's 100 to 150 light manufacturing jobs now. 
we do workforce development for about 400 youth right now. I can count on a number of businesses that will hire, but it strikes us that the best thing we can to do is create jobs ourselves as a nonprofit. It's really where the leading edge is for social services. This model fits incredibly well. So now you have workforce development, community development, job creations, and the ability without take agreements to be self-funding. And then once it goes into that, you start to generate tax revenues and jobs and all the things that is the holy grail for us here in the city. Um, it is a unique opportunity because of the farm to table movement and the outtake agreement. When I ran my uh, material handling business uh, and we were headquartered in Bristol, you are within 100 miles, 100 miles of 60% of US markets. So the opportunity to create a major green business is extraordinary, but the notion of an urban partnership between for-profit, non-profit, social services, I think is unprecedented. We, uh, we have a pilot going with Church Farm School, one of my sister agencies on education around vertical urban farming. Uh, we're staying away from the, the, uh, the, the hydroponics and the fish just because of that's a different technology. This is a very straightforward piece. Um, but those are the things that, that you all could do that would, would help. We'll come to you with three sites, maybe four. We'll be able to line up funding. We don't have to come to you for the capital. What you can help us with is if we have the outtake agreements locked up, there are investors, socially responsible investing, Goldman, Bank of New York Mellon, private that would be delighted to invest in this space and then in fact um, we can rock and roll and turn it right back into the work. So I, we've spent three years looking for job and workforce development. This is by far the highest potential uh, that we've been able to find. So I'll stop there, sir. Other than being in a situation where you learn where seeds come from and this being a great job, the other is putting people together. I call it, my economic theory is peanut butter meets jelly to yep. make some bread. And th this resource doesn't know that resource exists. And then by bringing them together, there's this synergistic effect that creates greater value. A large, a large part of the work we do at ECS in our community development and economic mobility, our single focus is to lift people, excuse me, to give them a hand up rather than be a safety net to lift people and break the cycle of intergenerational economic poverty. It simply comes down to a couple of variables, housing, workforce development, education enrichment, wellness, and some financial targeted. Workforce development is incredibly important. The mentoring side for the youth we serve the awareness that they have of opportunities, and this, we, we break it down between hard and soft skills, councilman. It's not the hard skills, the technical skills, it's the soft skills. If I can team 15 youth with Jack in a farm for six months or his peers and teach them that skill, when they go for the next job, if they decide they don't want to stay, they've built resume, they've built credibility, they've built a bunch of things. Plus, we can do it and make good money at 18 bucks an hour. So the outtake agreement that you guys are helping on and the regulatory side of this thing, we can get moving. And that's really where this thing comes together in a major way. So I guess I can call him Jack. Why don't you, yeah. why don't you share a strawberry together? You're kind of close. Yeah. Um, so um, when we were talking with Jack, it was what was intriguing wasn't his uh, aptitude towards the actual farming, his cost analysis of what he was doing and the per unit price of a sprout impressed me. Um, because I understand the difference between knowing that and not knowing that is a hobby. Now, you can be in a hobby all day. If you, you Look, I've, I've grown a lot of businesses. Most of the successful businesses that I've been involved with in start with understanding the need for talent 
and then fundamentally understanding the business and also having a different makes make a different a difference making technology jack has done this i call him thomas edison quite frankly he's a little verbal i'll grant you that but <laughs> but he's one of the smartest people that i know and it's the okay. light I call technology him the Chuck of vegetables that is yeah but the light side. the light technology and the the ability to run farms remotely imagine if you had a call center here with a couple hundred people working in it managing farms in cities all over the country sure. that's not an unreasonable vision here imagine that you had software labs down at the navy yard supporting where you go through go to our university go to john fry go to penn i mean there is an opportunity here for manufacturing the chance to really be a socially responsible model for job creation and the ability to just make a significant difference in the environment i i don't know many business projects i've had where i can go with that the other thing Jack said, I mean, I spent six years getting a Whole food certification for the flower business. Let me tell you, the fact that Jack has that answers a lot of your questions on quality, on safety. I mean, we don't need a, and I, I don't want to pick on a, a very good business, but the Chipotle problem with E. coli damn near brought them under. Um, we've been very, very sensitive to that, that business risk. And, and going through. So there's some, some opportunities here that are extraordinary. So one of the other things, and I appreciate your business um, and kinder, gentler form of it. Um, one of the things that I retained from the visit was that Jack was able to produce a red versus a green basil. And he quickly realized that people didn't like red basils, eye color, whatever. Yep. But he beta tested it and then was able to adapt back quickly. So I guess responding to what is in demand, this vertical farming offers that ability to do it quickly. I wondered to know if anyone has done a cost analysis of time versus growth time to profitability of vegetable analysis. We, we uh, and I won't take up time today but be happy to come back jack and i we have built and looked uh, at pro formas for investors which is where we are right now i'm in front of the investors on behalf on behalf of jack uh, we can be up and running very very quickly and profitable very quickly there's a couple of reasons for that one the outtake agreement the whole key with the outtake agreement to retain them is you have to be a steady and high quality supplier. Um, one of my other board members is the president of Four Seasons Fresh Produce. They've experimented with this space many times. They're the top end supplier to many of the chains on the East Coast. You need to have a guaranteed supply. One of the reasons the model of a diversity of farms is if you get a catastrophic, you're not out of business. The idea of not building a single large farm is incredibly important and have a partnership of farms. You can get there, we think, within 60 to 90 days after you're up and running and building to get a crop going through. The beauty of this business, just to go down to one level of, of detail, is as an investor, I'm, I'm not going to ask you for capital. I'm going to ask you to buy the equipment and lease it back to me. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm a 501c3. I don't need the depreciation. Because it's agriculture, you can depreciate this asset over seven years. That's the way the law currently reads. So as an investor, if I go to you and I can offer you a 10 or 14% return on leveraged, and then I give it tax advantage to you because of the depreciation, all of a sudden that goes into the low, or excuse me, the high teens, low 20s. I, I would just urge you to take a look at that return vis-a-vis -vis anything else that's available in the market and add to the fact that it's socially responsible. 
attracting investing is not going to be the issue. The issue is the infrastructure and the speed and the support. If you guys can deliver the outtake volume that you're talking about, we can build, I'm speaking for Jack here, I'm, I'm interested in three or four of these in the communities we serve, but I'm also helping Jack because of my background. I also think it's great for the city, and at the end of the day, that's what a social service agency should do. So that economics and speed allows us to get profitable very quickly because then I'm just paying a lease payment and I don't have a huge capital overhang and, and all those things. I think the skill and the time will be to train people. So that's why the pilot's so impressive and important. Jack can bring young men and women down and train them right now. And then we can go out and off we go. We'll let the next um, yep. person to testify speak, but things that Jack talked about uh, in his site visit was that there were two gentlemen, one of them one might have been a vet, one was, I believe, a returning person from incarceration. And they didn't know he was in uh, the back room listening to them. And they said, hey, we found a quicker way to do this. We don't have to do all of this work. And the other person stopped him and said, no, we're not going to do it the quick way. We're going to do it the, the right, right way. way. And he, it was like a proud papa moment for him because what he was trying to instill in them was an integrity to the work that you do, which is a valuable lesson that you can take in vegetables or in corporate boardrooms for that matter. So, Well said. All right. I, I, I did listen to you, Jack. I actually did. Good afternoon, Good Chairman afternoon. Jones and Councilman Taubenberger. My name is Claire Kellaway, and I'm here with Steven Scardina from Bon Appetit Management Company, the food service provider at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're here to attest to the University of Pennsylvania's commitment to support local food production. So Bon Appetit was founded in 1987 with the mission to introduce restaurant quality scratch cooking to college and corporate cafeterias. Today we manage the food at over 650 cafes in 33 states. And we are grateful to have been recognized by many leading foundations, nonprofits, and industry associations for our socially and environmentally responsible sourcing policies, one of which being our commitment to support local food businesses. In the late 1990s, Bon Appetit chefs were realizing that the mass marketed produce that they were buying was grown for shelf life and not necessarily taste. And so in search of fresher and more flavorful foods, they began connecting with local farmers and artisans. And it was these relationships that set us on our path to Bon Appetit's current mission, which is providing food service for a sustainable future. So in 1999, Bon Appetit began what's called our Farm to Fork program, which tasks chefs to source at least 20% of their ingredients from small, local, and owner-operated farms. And we defined local as within 150 miles of a cafe, operations with under $5 million in annual revenue, and owner-operated businesses, meaning the owner is involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Altogether, these purchases add up to tens of millions of dollars that we reinvest in our communities every year. This commitment to local sourcing is critical at a time when food production is increasingly concentrated. Over the past century, Americans, America's small and mid-sized farmers and artisans have been squeezed out of a food and beverage industry, which, as Mr. Griffin stated, is our single largest economy. This is one of the reasons why I am inspired by Metropolis Farms' commitment to democratize their farming model, making starting a successful urban farm feasible and profitable for more aspiring entrepreneurs and putting more people to work feeding our communities. There is also promise in the growing demand we see for local food. We know that in recent years, the number of farmers markets and CSAs has grown significantly, and yet we also know that less than half of local foods are purchased through what are called these direct-to-consumer markets. According to the USDA in 2012, 2.7 billion of the total $5 billion spent on local food in the US happened at what's called the intermediary market level, or grocery stores, restaurants, and institutions like those that Bon Appetit serves. Thus, it's critical to leverage the institutional purchasing power of institutions to support regional food systems, which is something I think we all heard earlier today. So as a food service company, Bon Appetit's purchases can provide much needed consistency for small businesses because of the large volumes of food that we buy. 
Our chefs pride themselves in their relationships with local farmers and artisans working closely with producers to buy things that they're trying to move or trying to get rid of or have an excess of, or also working with them to project our demand so we can work with farmers to plan their plots, knowing a chef's needs and guaranteeing a certain volume of sales for these businesses. And as a part of my job, I travel the country and meet with many farmers and entrepreneurs who provide food for our cafes. And time and time again, I hear from them how critical Bon Appetit's purchases are to their businesses, whether it's a pig farmer in southern Minnesota that was brought from the brink of bankruptcy when two local colleges started buying from them, or where I live in Baltimore, a nonprofit urban farm based in Sandtown, Winchester, that uses steady purchases from nearby Goucher College to prop up their balance books and offer produce to their immediate community at a discount. Or, to the point of this hearing, a high-tech vertical farm like Metropolis in South Philadelphia that can invest in towers of plants knowing they have a guaranteed buyer in the University of Pennsylvania. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steven Scardina to talk more about Bon Appetit's operations at Penn specifically. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As Claire stated, I'm the man Say your name again. For Steven the Scardina. So I'm the man on the ground at the University of Penn operating 14 cafes uh, that Bon Appetit manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have a blend of residential and retail operations at the university where students from the and faculty from the Penn community can share the opportunity of breaking bread and share a from scratch locally sourced meal together away from the stresses of their daily routines. In our cafes, Bon Appetit employs approximately 310 associates. 91.4% of those associates are from the city of Philadelphia. Since 2009, Bon Appetit continues its commitment to source locally grown or locally crafted products to use in the menu preparation or sell in our retail operations. Claire refer referred to our Farm to Fork program, which we have just recently expanded to also include locally crafted product within 150 miles of Philadelphia. With that being said, we've developed a partnership with um, the DARS, with the Enterprise Center, excuse me, through the, the Darwin's H. Hamilton Center for Culinary Enterprises. From the, um, the Culinary Center, we work with local artisans who are in an incubator program to further develop their customer base with the hopes of opening their own businesses within the city limits. Since 2009, we have increased our percentage of farm-to-fork purchases at the university from 10.5% to 16% during the 2015-2016 academic year. So our commitment to purchase locally um, is truly one that we walk the walk with every day and charge our chefs to do so. Our campus-wide expenses for food procurement is eight, over $8 million in academic year. Of that, 1.5 million what? is produce. Through our partnership with the Common Market, the Culinary Center, and other small local artisans, we have experienced significant growth in purchasing local, and we're always looking for new partnerships. Recently, as Jack referred uh, to, and during his comments, and as Claire just referred to, we have made a commitment to work with Jack in regard to the program that he's, we have all had the opportunity to visit. And we're very ex excited about expanding that partnership. We're still in the um, talking stages of how we're going to go about doing that, considering the volume. If you think about the number of meals we serve at the university, we serve close to a quarter of a million meals a, a year at the University of Pennsylvania. In addition, we also work with some local celebrity chefs. Um, Rick Ballas, who was the first winner of Top Chef Masters, and also a well-known DC-based chef, uh, Jose Andres. I don't know if you've seen um, the articles that were recently in Philadelphia Magazine with uh, Beefsteak opening on Philadelphia, uh, Penn, on Penn's campus, the first outside of the DC market. And it's a great opportunity for our staff to work with these celebrity chefs and also a great opportunity for us to expand purchasing locally within uh, the Philadelphia market. Thank you. Thank you all. Ms. Smith, last but not least. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairman and uh, 
council members. I um, want to thank you first for inviting, for okay. introducing me, Councilman Tautenberger, first and foremost. You got to say your name for the record, please. I said, did I say, oh, my name. Yeah. Oh, Carol Smith. And I'm the executive director of the Beckett Life Center, as, long, as well as the Union Housing Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit real estate development corporation here in Philadelphia. Um, and I just want to thank you for introducing me to all my new best friends. Um, I got extremely excited to hear about what you're doing. Um, met uh, Jack back in July when I toured Metropolis during the DNC, as well as took a trip up to Harrisburg to see what NTAG and a couple of other people are, going, are doing. I'm super excited because I'm here, and um, Councilman Jones, as you know, from 25 years ago, as a proponent for the little guy. And so i super excited to have witnessed um, we have a 132-unit non-pro—I mean, a housing development unit at um, 16th and Cecil. B I mean, 16th and Jefferson. Smack dab in the middle of it is a 8,400-square-foot community center. In the back of it, we have a couple garden beds, and I've watched what urban agriculture can do for these folks. Okay, I've watched the children who wouldn't go outside and put their hands in the dirt put their hands in the dirt and not take their hand. We have to yank them out of the dirt. Um, I've seen the woman who's been able to save her house and pay her mortgage because she's growing microgreens in her living room. Um, I've seen the difference in our children since we've taken snacks out, regular snacks out of our after school program and only giving them organic, healthy, um, not in process snacks. So we understand the importance of what's going on. Um, commend Mr. Griffin um, and what he's doing. I'm doing somersaults. I'm, I'm still here shaking to hear the things that ECS is doing. We're the little guy. Um, we, uh, the reason why I wanted to come here was to get, throw our hat in the ring and to see how all this really translates down, way down into the neighborhood, um, into jobs, into um, how we have a seat at the table. ECS is great. It sounds wonderful. We want to be at ECS when we grow up. But we wanted to come in in the forefront and see how City Council can help make sure that all this love is spread all the way down. So, so Ms. Uh, Smith, little is relative. How many units in North Philly do you manage? It's 132 apartments. Apartments. One, right. Okay, so apartments. little is, you know, it's not a seed. It's a sprout by it's now. It's a sprout. And you also are doing um, some um, uh, vertical farming and We are hoping to do it. We, um, at Fifth and Olney, we have a warehouse that we just acquired some hydro aquaponic tanks. We've worked with Dr. Um, Dr. Hughes has come up and seen our operation. Um, Councilman Tottenberg has seen what we're doing there. Um, we have... Uh, hydroponics and aquaponics systems in there that we want. We have uh, hoop farms in our backyard. Um, we sit right there at 5th. Um, Councilman, Councilwoman Bass was there this morning to tour it's in her, in her district. So um, we're up and ready, but we need this kind of partnership. We need to sit at the table with these, our big brothers here that can show us how we can translate this down to the smaller minority-owned businesses. So that's why I said earlier Bringing people together is an important part of our job because sometimes until you're all in the same room or all at the same meeting or all in the same work, you don't know what exists. And that's what I'm glad about. Well, Councilman Green was first, and then we'll end yep. with you, Councilman. Okay. Yeah, yeah obviously, I think. I'll try to answer. No, go ahead. I think you're well, right. I was Councilman. just going to say one of the things that we take great pride in at our agency is we'll share with everybody. There's, in one of my experience, there's way too much competition between agencies, mm. and we're hard over to be the other side of that equation. So we we look for partner. We're focused in three neighborhoods, but the expertise we're happy to share with anybody. I appreciate so. that. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Uh, I just want to say a couple of quick comments for. Uh, I think we're about to close the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Beggar Life Center, I've had an opportunity to visit there a couple of times. Uh, you've done phenomenal work um, in that part of North Philadelphia. And I'm also glad to hear uh, about being more entrepreneurial. I often talk that nonprofits need to be much more entrepreneurial. So to hear that you're trying to diversify um, income stream to provide opportunities for people 
who come to Becca Life Center, but at the same time trying to diversify your revenue stream, which is similar to what Mr. Uh, Griffiths was talking about, because I think one of the things that hurts nonprofits is that they get most of their money, like Lutheran Family Services, from one income stream, as opposed to trying to diversify their income stream by looking at entrepreneurial ventures. So I commend you for an, initiating that type of discussion among the organization. I know that can be hard as a board, and I also commend um, Episcopal for doing that over the years. And then, just to wrap up with Bon Appetit, I'm glad that you're going to be having those conversations or in conversations uh, with Metropolis Farms because that was one of the questions I was going to ask. Um, as an attorney, I'm not going to delve into those questions because I know you're in a, in a deliberation process, but I'm also glad to hear that you're working with Common Market. I've known Hailey and Tatiana for a long time and they're doing phenomenal work now, not starting here in the city of Philadelphia, but up and around the East Coast and also yes, moving in the Midwest as well. So thank you for working with them. So it's interesting. Um, I think Councilman Green was the author of the resolution talking about how to get co-ops to work together. Yeah. And I got uh, Councilman Tallenberger on the other side now talking about vertical farming and hydro farming. So uh, it's proof positive here. Democrats and Republicans Absolutely. can find common interests. I'm very proud to be a part of that. So are there any other questions? I, I do. And, and, and very quick, and, and, and also thanking, and um, also another, you, you spur my memory, my brains here. Uh, Co-ops, actually, when it comes to agriculture, are very, very common, have been, been, been used in this country and in this state for hundreds of years. It's really something, and actually internationally. Co-ops, uh, I'm not going to be so bold to say they grew out of agriculture, but they certainly are a big, big, big part of it. I mean, the cranberry uh, ocean spray, that's a co-op. A, a co yep. and, there, and there's many, many others as well. Um, but what I did want to do was, was uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Claire Calloway and, and uh, David Griffith and Stephen uh, Scardina for, for, for attending. Your uh, input, your testimony was very insightful, knowledgeable to me. But I do have a question uh, for Ms. Smith. Um, and also a thank you. One, thank you for coming, because your perspective is, 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 is very important. And thank you for the invite to tour your facility. And I'm very excited for your you know, future uh, being there and, 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 and what you can bring to this. You sort of elaborated a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, you know, more directly. Being small, being new to this, being at the, in, in some ways, you're the pioneers, but you're the type of pioneers we need to develop. What, is, what are some of the things the city could do for you to get your operation up and running? Um, well, absolutely, connecting us with regulations. We've, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we cannot do and could not do or stop doing. For instance, when we were going to put the walls, the uh, actual sheetrock up in our, our warehouse, we had four or five different people telling us what we can do and what we can't do. Um, we'd already purchased sheet rock, so that was an outlay of cash that we probably should not have done. Okay. So, you know, first and foremost, just connecting us and getting us a seat at the table, maybe on an advisory committee or part of the initial team. Um, secondly, of course, yes, through the, like um, Mr. Griffin mentioned, you know, having a way to, to wiggle through the red tape of L&I um, and helping establish some of those things I think haven't been thought about. I guess, yeah, go ahead. I, I can't emphasize enough. Councilman, the, the daunting, we're, I mean, we have our day job, we're fundraising, we're trying to navigate through contracts, but when we go to do this stuff and we run into layers upon layers upon layers of, of paperwork and, and I dare say bureaucracy that, that just bogs us down and, and we're of a size where we can fight it, but I mean, I remember the days starting out. If, if there's a place that says vertical farming is going to be an important industry and there's a resource you can go to and says, here's the A to B to C to D, and if you do these things, you can start building. Here's how you get safety. Here's where you go. Mm -hmm. and, and that way then, because what kills you is when you think you've done everything. Right. And you've made commitments, and then the inspector comes out and says, "Oh, I forgot to tell you about this." Yeah, that, and that's not good at all. It, it, and I've been in the construction business a long time, and and I got to tell you, it, it's it's daunting. Right. So there's so, a, actually it's hurtful. I mean, if they're going to wait it, that long, they're, it, they're really it, pushing it, you back. But but I think through your auspices, the ability to create 
you know, design it once and get everybody to sign off once that your peer agencies and say this is the deal and if you follow this template we'll get your approval because we're going to go out to funders, we're going to go out to investors right? and what kills you is when you go six months past your deadline and you've lined up financing and interest rates change and all of a sudden you're dead man walking. So, so that two, would be very helpful. There are two hemispheres of the brain, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. There's the private sector who responds to certain stimuli quickly because of pain. Yep. And then there's government, which is almost anesthetized in its pain receptors <laughs> and don't have to move as quickly. And so getting them to work on the same time frame is our challenge. But, but we have common motivation, Councilman. There's 400,000 people living in poverty in, in the city of Philadelphia. Our ambition is a time when that's not true. It won't be in my lifetime, but it, we absolutely ought to come. If this leads to employment and we, work we and kids getting STEM education and moving through, I, I would argue let's, this find, is why, let's find the pain and fix it. And this is why this Councilman set me up, drug me down to see the vertical farm, literally had a staffer sitting by my uh, parking spot so That's that correct. I didn't walk in this building. And so um, I said it in the beginning, I'll say it again, a picture's worth a thousand words, one visit's worth a thousand pictures. We see the urgency. And if I, if I may wrap up, um, we also, maybe there's a set aside for smaller minority businesses. Uh, we do a lot of work with EOP here in the city of Philadelphia where you have set asides. Um, maybe there's a, because we don't have the capital. We're, I, mean, I can't tell you I don't, I don't need your money <laughs> to, or somebody's money. So. No, but one of the things we're willing to absolutely do is to help people put together an investor pool. That people, Peanut butter, that, meat, jelly. That can, no, we'll, we'll, we'll exchange cards and we'll do all that. That's the beauty of these deals. But there are investor pools that her profile. If you go to Cat Rose Quetta up at Penn, the high impact philanthropy group, one of the projects she's working on is how to put together pools of capital that people can tap into wow. because you don't have necessarily the time or the expertise to, to go get that. That's where these, these co ops and these consortiums can be incredibly invaluable. I mean, I would love to see council sponsor a thing on, on entrepreneur and for-profit in the nonprofit sector. We're, we're going to get hammered in the next four years because yeah, just not Republican right. or Democrat, we're going to get hammered on government funding. If we have another state contract year like we had last year, you're going to see other agencies fold. Mm -hmm. Necessity mm -hmm. is the mother of invention. You bet. And we will, we see the urgency that you speak. Yeah. Um, Councilman, you want to close this out? Close, closing statement from, from, from my perspective. Um, I want to thank all, all the witnesses uh, for all their, their testimony. It was all very, very worthwhile. And I will say for the record, um, I and my staff, because this hearing is so important, we were really prepared to kidnap you if necessary to bring <laughs> they you me, to, They had my parking space staked out. I kid you not. To bring you to, to uh, Met Metropolis Farm so you could get an even better understanding. I mean, we anyone that was here today got a better understanding through the video and the testimony. But to actually see it is a whole different realm again. So those that have invited me to their, we, we want to come again and we want to invite other folks. I mean, that goes from... Uh, Dr. Hughes at, at Cheney and, and, and Ms. Smith, also your, what you showed me, I, I, we, we all learn by that. And, and, and I'm very fortunate to, to have a degree in agriculture, agronomy, uh, which I think can be a great help to my colleagues. But more importantly, you were a great help to me today because I came away, even though I'm, I'm an agronomist by academic training, I learned quite a bit today. So I want to thank you all for that opportunity, Mr. Chairman, also for you to have this uh, committee meeting, and also for my colleagues, uh, Councilman Green and, and, and others that, that were here today. I think we all learned a lot of things together. Thank you. Thank you. So there's hope for me. I'm a city boy, born and raised, but none of you were second generation farmers. And I, you are, oh gosh. All right, well, at least I have good eyes. I, I, I have good eyes. So before I um, close this out, for the record, uh, bill number 161015 is being held at the request of the sponsor, um, so that anybody who might have come here to testify, please know that it was being held. And then finally, I want to thank everybody. Uh, this concludes 
uh, our uh, hearing. Um, and we will uh, hold to the recall of the recess to the call of the chair. And I know what I'm having for dinner. Thank you all. Some basil.